So good morning, everybody. So thank you for being back for this morning section. So it's my pleasure to give you the floor to Filippo, who is going to continue with like neuroquantum states number two. Filippo, thank you. Thank you, Augusto. <clears throat> okay, so I will try to wake you up. Sorry, I will try to wake you up in this early morning session, in my opinion. Um, so I would just like to quickly recap uh, what Giuseppe has pre presented on Monday. Um, and then I would like to move on a bit and discuss uh, natural gradient descent, so a way to avoid uh, essentially falling into a local minima and never getting out of them and not finding uh, the ground state in particular. This will also be useful for us to discuss uh, time evolution and solving the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, which we will do tomorrow. And then uh, we will briefly discuss uh, symmetries. And uh, I hope to have more time today to, to show some real first-hand examples in a brief and on at the end. Okay, so uh, if you remember, uh, I use this funny notation of Brian Katz. Uh, so this is just uh, um, a column vector. And uh, the, the gist of what we do essentially is that uh, we are approximating those, uh, those vectors that live in a very um, high dimensional Hilbert space, uh, high dimensional space um, with, uh, with essentially with a neural network that I use to encode the, the logarithm of every entry in this vector. So if you want, as Giuseppe has said, you can think that I'm my 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 cat psi of theta is nothing else than some very long vector of psi of x of log psi theta of uh, let's say zero x log psi theta of one etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Only that instead of using 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc., what we are using are uh, essentially basis elements in a configuration space, uh, which will be vectors in this out in bubble bar, let's say, plus minus 1 to the n. Okay? So it's essentially a string of bits. We use plus minus 1, but you can also use uh, 0 and 1, so doesn't change much. Okay, so this is our representation, and uh, this solves uh, the memory problem for us because if I have an exponentially large, uh, an exponentially long uh, vector in an exponentially large uh, Hilbert space, uh, then I would need uh, exponentially large amounts of memory. When I say exponentially large, I mean that it's increasing exponentially in in n, so in the number of particles or degrees of freedom that I want to treat in my system. Um, so instead, if I use a neural network encoding with a set of parameters theta, which is only polynomially large, so whose number grows polynomially in n, uh, then, of course, I don't need exponentially amounts of memory anymore. And then, in general, in, in, in quantum mechanics, we are interested in computing expectation values of quantities onto a state. So the expectation value is defined as, uh, as this dot product, right? So this Simply, this is a quadratic form, right? Psi theta transpose, H is a matrix, which encodes, uh, it's the Hamiltonian, which encodes all the uh, physical properties of the system that we're interested in. And Psi theta, again, is my vector. Okay, um, the denominator here simply means that uh, we want our states to be normalized. So essentially, those are uh, vectors, like uh, physically, the, the magnitude of a vector has uh, no interpretation, at least uh, in, in this particular uh, uh, description of quantum mechanics, and therefore we are just normalizing according to the norm. So ideally, we would like to work with uh, vectors that are unit normalized. We don't necessarily need to do, we just have to carry around this normalization. And then we can recast this, uh, this formula, which uh, would have uh, two sums over uh, exponentially many elements. So. If you wanted to compute this in practice, I could insert here an identity, right? So a sum over x over the whole basis. And so this sum would contain exponentially many elements. And I would have two of them. So 
again, maybe I solve the memory problem, but I also have to solve the the num the the growing, the exponentially fast growing number of operations that I need to do to compute this expectation value. And the way we do this is by estimating those observables, those expectation values, by means of uh, Monte Carlo sampling. So what we do is that we can analytically rewrite this formula into an expectation value over a certain probability distribution, psi of x square, of a certain uh, estimator, E log, which uh, again, log simply means it's, uh, well, partly it's an historic, uh, an historic uh, naming, uh, if you want. Uh, log means it's local in, in the sense of this basis element. So it only depends on this basis element x. And this object essentially will contain a sum over y of h, x, y. So those are the matrix element x, y of psi theta of x divided by psi theta of, sorry, psi theta of y divided by psi theta of x. And uh, if the Hamiltonian is physical, so for let's say for most physical Hamiltonians, uh, we have this very nice feature that uh, it will be row sparse and there will be only a very small amount, usually linear in the number of, uh, of degrees of freedom, so linear in n, number of non-zero entries. Uh, so this sum over y is very cheap. even in... So the cost of computing a single local energy is polynomial. And then this expectation value, I will use Monte Carlo integration instead of computing it exactly. So I will draw a bunch of samples from psi theta x uh, square, and I will compute E log only for this very small set of samples, and I will average it. Okay? Yes. I have a couple a couple of questions. So first, like we are taking the logarithm there. So uh, am I? We have to think about that as a complex logarithm, or or the amplitudes there are real. Yes, so it it depends. Uh, in in some cases we will we we can work with, uh, um, let's say, psi, in some cases psi theta of x will be a positive number, so you can just take uh, log psi of theta to be uh, any any real number, and that's fine because the exponential will be positive. In other cases, uh, um, psi theta will be complex, and so you have to think of it as the complex. Algorithm. Okay. It it really depends on the physical structure of of the problem. However, please, uh, I would like to underline the fact that in our approach, we never take this logarithm. So what we are doing is that we are saying that the logarithm will be approximated by a neural network with parameters theta of x. Okay, so this is related with my second question. That also helps in the sampling because I guess that sampling from that yes. probability distribution is not okay. Cool, thanks. It's uh, for numerical precision issues. Uh, we are encoded like if you want the output of our neural network is the logarithm of the wave function, the logarithm of the entries uh, in your vector, so that we can more easily sample from it, and uh, and also when we want to compute those terms in the local energy. It's um, you can you can go to much higher precisions by 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 encoding the logarithm, because this ratio here, they might have very very different uh, orders of magnitude, but so with the logarithm you're just compressing them. You have a, a smaller dynamical range. Okay, um, yes. So we have the local energy, and in general, uh, being a physicist, we are interested in. Uh, we're interested in looking for the ground state of the Hamiltonian. Yes. Uh, sorry, I, I can't read, which is the, um, uh, the distribution from which we sample X in the expectation. It's a psi theta square. Psi theta square, perfect. It's this. Perfect, thank you. The reason is, uh, let's say, quantum mechanical in nature. But if you want, uh, we always interpret the, the wave function as a, um, as a complex probability distribution, as a complex amplitude, sorry. And the square modulus of, of psi gives us the probability distribution. So essentially what we can measure experimentally. 
So if you want the physical object that can be interpreted, that can be measured in the in the laboratory, it's always uh, psi square. Psi encodes some some phases that give rise to interference effects. Okay, so being a physicist, what we are interested in is uh, determining the ground state of the Hamiltonian, meaning that if you perform the eigen decomposition of it, right? Uh, write it like that. Uh, then we are interested in finding epsilon zero, assuming that epsilon zero is smaller than epsilon one and it's smaller than epsilon n, okay? So I use this uh, slight abuse of notation where epsilon uh, is a scalar number, so it's an eigenvalue, and uh, cat epsilon is the uh, eigen eigenstate, or yeah, eigenstate, okay? Therefore, um, Giuseppe has shown you that we have this uh, variational principle, so we know we, it's relatively easy to prove that if you compute these variational energy, so the energy for a certain uh, set of parameters theta, it is easy to show that E of theta will always be larger than epsilon zero, so the ground state energy or the lowest uh, eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian. And therefore, I can I can think of my energy as a loss function, and I'm trying to minimize it. Okay, great. So, in the way we compute uh, we, the way we compute the gradient um, is uh, similar in spirit to what we are doing for the energy. So we we can show that the gradient of the Hamiltonian of the sorry of the expectation value is a covariance between uh, the vector of Elox, so of the local energies, so the vector containing the local energy for a set of samples and uh, the log derivatives, okay? By the way, I would like to underline one interesting feature, which is that in practice, so if you have a set of samples, a set, set of samples X, we are writing this as a sum over X, let's say from, from your set of samples, of uh, um, of delta e log by delta I mean exactly this of x. Let no, let's write it like this of uh, x i times no x j sorry times now I take the derivative with respect of theta i of log psi of xj, okay? The reason this is valid is because uh, uh, you can show that, essentially, you can remove this, uh, this term from here because this is a covariance. Now, if you look carefully, this is a vector Jacobian product. So if you think of your function log psi, that is taking as input uh, a, a vector of uh, configurations axis, so in this case xj, and uh, it depends on a set of parameters theta i, then here what I'm doing is I'm performing the summation, so I'm summing over this internal dimension double by xj. Is it clear? Yeah. So the way that we can implement this in practice uh, is by using auto diff engines to do vector Jacobian products directly. So if you want reverse mode automatic differentiation, which will be much more efficient than explicitly computing the Jacobian. So uh, computing the gradient for every possible uh, element X and then by hand uh, performing the, the Jacobian vector product. If you, if you use automatic differentiation to directly compute this quantity, uh, you will never see, you will never uh, materialize the Jacobian in, in, in memory, this will give you uh, a quadratic speed up, quadratic in the number of samples, so in the size of X. Okay. So this is what we do in essence. Um, at every iteration, we will take a set of samples X by running Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling. We compute the gradient of the energy using this formula. We have a gradient. We do stochastic gradient descent. Adam, 
whatever neat and fancy optimizer uh, you want to use. And in general, what will happen is that the energy starts to go down. So if I plot the function of a number of iterations, the energy, we will see that this goes down. And sometimes does not converge to the ground state. So what can we do? Uh, in physics, uh, there is uh, <coughs> in physics uh, in physics we tend to use uh, to to think of uh, to think very highly of a technique that we call uh, imaginary time evolution which allows us to directly converge to the ground state of any Hamiltonian. And uh, this is similar maybe to the, it's a continuous version of the power method, if you, if you, if you know it. So the idea is relatively simple. Um, so I can define a state uh, Psi of Tau. Uh, psi Tau. So if you want, I can take uh, the, the, the wave function that uh, is obtained by evolving uh, some initial state psi zero by e to the minus h tau, okay? So I would like to remind you that uh, in the Schrodinger equation of motion, we are usually evolving by e to the minus i h tau. So we have, uh, so which is generating, which, which means that our uh, time evolution operator is unitary which means that we are rotating in a sense. Instead here, I, I'm, I'm doing uh, what we call an imaginary time because essentially I'm, I'm removing the high from the unitary time evolution. And this object now will contract me towards the ground state. And a relatively easy way to see this is just to, um, to expand this in the basis of, uh, of H. So then you get something that looks like sum over all eigenvalues, epsilon of e to the minus, let's call it epsilon i, epsilon i tau of chi i epsilon, where I define, where I'm taking ci to be epsilon psi zero, epsilon i psi zero. In the denominator, I have the square root of sum over epsilon i, psi i square e to the minus uh, two epsilon i tau. And now if we consider the quantity, so, so if we consider the overlap, sorry, the normalized I, overlap. Can I ask two questions? Yes. So this is epsilon i, I believe in the numerator. Right, so in the cat. Yes, sorry. Okay. And the other thing is, so this e to the minus h tau is really the exponential of the matrix. Yes. Right, okay. So if you want, what I'm doing here, I'm simply saying e to the minus h tau can be written as x sum over uh, epsilon i, epsilon i, epsilon i, epsilon i. And then I'm writing psi zero as sum over epsilon i of epsilon i, epsilon i, psi zero. This gives me a ci. And then it is easy to see that this is acting diagonally on epsilon i. And so I can just replace in the exponential the eigenvalues. Does it make sense? Okay, so now if we try to look at uh, the overlap between the ground state, so epsilon zero, and my state at time tau, okay, so this is a number, we can call it uh, uh, psi zero of tau, and this will be epsilon zero psi tau, 
divided by uh, say tau square. Then this quantity is simply, if you want it, I simply need to project this uh, onto epsilon zero. So this will be epsilon zero, and then I simply put this here, right? I get sum over epsilon i of phi minus epsilon i tau ci i epsilon i divided by epsilon i ci i square e to the minus two epsilon i tau. Okay. Um, now what we can do is uh, well from this from this uh, from this projector the only the only term in this sum that uh, that that survives is the one acting on epsilon zero because uh, all the eigen all the epsilon all the eigencats are uh, are orthogonal of course and so here we have something that looks like c zero square e to the minus epsilon i tau divided by sum over epsilon i of c i square e to the minus two. Uh, sorry, here it's epsilon zero, uh, epsilon i tau. And then if we simply multiply and divide by e to the epsilon zero tau and e to the epsilon zero tau, you will see that this cancels out and essentially we are left with this thing. So c zero square, divided by sum over c square e to the minus two epsilon i minus epsilon zero tau. And if you take the limit for tau that goes to infinity, it is easy to see that essentially this becomes one. Okay? So if you want, what I'm saying is that if I if I'm able to some way variationally compute this time evolution here, evolve according to e to the minus h tau, which is not a unitary time evolution, so usually physicists don't don't like this much, uh, we will be contracting towards the ground state, and I can find it. So the power method is a discrete version of this. Now, what is particularly important is that since this is a contractor, if I if I am if I have some noisy terms along the evolution, so if you want if psi tau plus delta tau is equal to e to the minus h delta tau psi tau plus some noise term. This noise term will also be contracted and uh, I, I will not prove it, but it's possible to show that you will converge towards the ground state, towards epsilon zero uh, with a certain precision that depends on how large this delta is, but you will never be shot very far away. You will, even if delta is very, very strong, you will never end up very far from, from the ground state, okay? Okay, so now the question is, how can I do this with neural network quantum states? Because if I want to do this exactly, and, and physicists that use this technique uh, many times, very often, the problem is that again, Psi, of, uh, psi, psi is an, an exponentially large vector in the Hilbert space and applying the, the, the matrix exponential to psi requires uh, exponential cubic uh, uh, number of operations, so it's very expensive. So, <clears throat> in a sense, what we are trying to do is this. So this is the Hilbert space and this is my psi zero, if you want. And I'm looking at the dynamics generated by this uh, propagator, e to the minus h tau, that brings me towards epsilon zero, okay? However, I don't want to store my vector, my, my wave function. I want to store a set of parameters, theta zero, okay, theta zero, thanks to my neural network encoding, is associated to a vector in the Hilbert space. But I want only to store t0. 
theta zero, okay? So this will be psi, this will not be psi of zero, but will actually be psi theta zero. Now I would like to perform the time evolution. So let's say I will do one step and I will end up here, right? But now what I want to do is I want to find the psi of delta tau that is associated to that point because I don't want to store, I don't want to work with vectors in the Hilbert space. I want to stay, I want to write an algorithm that operates on uh, in, in the variational manifold, in the, in the space of, uh, of parameters of my neural network. <clears throat> so the objective will be to find a way to recast if you want uh, the, 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 this dynamical equation, d in the tau of uh, psi tau equal to minus h psi tau, okay? I want to recast this into some dynamic, some dynamical equation d in the theta of psi theta of some, sorry. Uh, the theta in the tau of something, okay? So I'm looking to recast the, the exponentially many uh, set of uh, equation for this uh, evolutor with a set of polynomially many uh, equations. And the way we can do that is by uh, in a sense, trying to perform this projection. So the, the, the intuition behind the, 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 the intuition of the approach that we take is we have a theta zero. We try to perturb it a bit by taking theta zero plus delta theta. And we look for the delta theta that when I map it to the hill in the Hilbert space is closest to the exactly evolved state. So in formulas, this means that I have my psi theta, let's say psi, psi theta, okay. I can apply e to the minus h delta tau. So I do a small step and I, and I call this phi. This is my target state. So it's the state that I exactly evolved. If I was able to perform exactly one small step, then this is the state I would obtain. And now I will try to match it to a new state, psi of theta plus delta theta, okay? And I will be trying to find the delta theta that for which those two states are uh, very close, right? Okay. So the way we do this is... Uh... <clears throat> so we need we need to use a, a few approximations to do this correctly. The first one is to say my target state is uh, e to the minus h tau psi theta. Sorry, the tau, and. Uh, um, Doing this matrix exponential would be very expensive computationally, so I cannot afford to do it. And since I'm considering small the taus, I can linearize this. Okay, so I can write this as identity minus h the tau plus square times applied to psi theta. Okay. Um, yes. And now I can consider another, can consider the other object. So the psi theta plus delta tau plus delta theta. And I can also expand this one. And I can assume that uh, mean realistically, if my if I take small steps in 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 time, then also the, the parameter should change relatively little. And so I can Taylor expand this around theta in delta theta. And I will get 
something that looks like uh, well psi of theta plus delta theta i uh, wait. it's okay I can o i psi of theta So where essentially it's easier to sh to see this proof if you want to see why it comes to this form by taking a single entry x psi theta plus delta theta. In this case, you get if you linear expand this uh, this object, you have uh, psi theta of x plus um, delta theta i d i psi theta and then you can divide by psi theta sorry psi theta of x and multiply by psi theta of x okay so this becomes the i log psi theta of x which is the oi as i defined up there and then psi theta of x is absorbed into my my vector here okay is that clear Okay. And in general, I will never write those sums when I have repeated indices. Um, then the uh, the O I is like it's it's not a an operator; it's a vector, right? But... Oh, I is, a, is an operator. It's, so it's a, a diagonal vector. operator. Uh, so what? Oh, okay. I see. Well, because theta theta projects on X. Okay. Okay. So if you, you want, is is an operator. So a matrix mm -hmm. that on its diagonal has the derivative of the log wave function. Okay. Okay. No, sorry. I was a bit confused. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you have a vector of operators if you want, in a sense, one for every I. Okay, so we have this expression. So I will and plus order of delta i square. So here I'm doing a, another abuse of notation, being a physicist, where uh, you could just assume that you have some uh, normal some 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 global magnitude here. So I would just call it delta. So in the end, I I will have identity plus delta theta i o i. So here there is a sum that I'm not writing. Psi theta, okay? Yes. Mm, uh, to, un uh, to understand, uh, for, for myself, to understand uh, the notation that uh, you have used, uh, we use the psi theta because psi theta is a wave function. Yes. And uh, it is parameterized, uh, the, the space of all wave function is parameterized by some uh, Rn with N uh, big. This is the reason why you, you could write uh, theta plus uh, small theta, delta theta. So can, can you repeat the question? Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so theta is a wave function and the space of all wave function is parameterized by uh, an Rn yes. with N uh, uh, really big. So we can write it psi theta plus delta theta because uh, we see the parameters the space of the parameterization yes okay. so if you want uh theta is a vector in the space of parameters w which is rn indeed and i'm i'm expanding psi theta in this space so if you want from a notation point of view when i write psi theta okay you can always think that what what i'm working with is sum of x of psi theta of x x okay and what i'm expanding is psi theta of x around the theta in delta theta okay so i'm expanding this scalar function but but then i i i carry around this vector like for every x this vector of of functions that i expanded okay X are the basis vectors of basis the Hilbert space. Hilbert space, okay. 
<laughs> so if you want, I, I'm working with two spaces. So my wave functions of my bracket notation operates, uh, assumes that I'm working with vectors in the Hilbert space, in the okay. exponentially large space. And okay. my objective at the end of all this uh, algebra is, in a sense, uh, to replace my my brackets, uh, so the, those objects that have uh, an infinitely, uh, uh, an exponentially expensive sum, I will try to replace those objects with uh, an expectation value where I can control the number of uh, terms that enter into the sum, okay? The other space I'm working with is the space of variational parameters theta, which is always the pedix. And in general, I will always be expanding. And, and this is, if you want, a continuous space, because this is a discrete space, in a sense. Um, so here I have a discrete basis, because my axes are both uh, 0, 1, or 1, minus 1, 1. Instead, here I have a continuous manifold. OK? <coughs> Okay, so now I have those two objects, uh, Psi theta plus Delta theta and Phi. And what I will try to do is I will try to find the Delta theta that minimizes the distance between the two of them. In principle, to do this proof uh, like correctly, we should now, why is this doing this? We should now normalize those objects because I want to take the distance between objects that have the same norm. Since uh, um, wave functions, so cats are normal are normalized. Since every time I take an expectation value, I I eliminate the the normalization. I want the distance between those two objects to be independent of the relative normalization. In principle, I should do this. So I should work with objects that are normalized like this. But the calculations become much more boring. So you, you have to carry out extra terms. And in the end, uh, you get uh, essentially the same set of equations with a normalization term. So I will not do it. OK. So now what we do is we define the vector delta, which is uh, phi minus psi theta plus delta theta. OK. And this is simply, um, ba, 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 this is uh, delta theta i or i Let's do it like that, uh, plus <laughs> No, let's keep it like that, it's better. Sorry. Yes. Doesn't change. H the tau psi theta. Sorry. And in this case, minus minus plus. Uh, yeah, it's good. Okay. Yes. Yes, okay. And now I will be looking, I want to find the minima of delta delta by by finding the ideal delta t i. Okay. So delta delta is, um, I can start building this object. It's psi theta of delta theta i or i. So for simplicity, I will assume that the theta i are real. They don't have to carry around uh, uh, now let me think. No, let's let so the proof is much simpler if we assume that the theta i are, are complex. But but you can also derive it in the case of uh, of 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 theta real plus uh, 
h d tau h is their mission okay and so now i can collect essentially three terms i, I have a delta theta i star um psi theta o i dagger o j psi theta delta theta j then i have a term that is uh, psi theta o i dagger h psi theta delta theta i star i have a complex conjugate and i have uh, the last term which is psi theta h square psi theta delta tau square and here there is a delta tau okay so now i can take and minimize this with respect to derivations in delta theta i star. And it's easy to see that I'm left with this term here, right? So psi theta o i dagger o j psi theta delta theta j and with this term here plus delta tau delta psi theta o i dagger h psi theta while this term depends on theta j star so it disappears and this one also okay and we want to put this to zero <clears throat> okay so essentially what what i obtained is uh, this structure i have i will call psi theta or i dagger or j psi theta i will call it s i j okay and this object is if i if i put an identity here is sum over x of psi theta o i dag x x o j psi theta okay and uh, if you want we can so if we were carrying around the normalization, we would have uh, we would have a normalizing term. But essentially, I can multiply and divide by psi theta of x. Uh, no, sorry, no, this is not true. Uh, what we can do is if I if I expand all those terms, I get sum over x of uh, psi theta of x because uh, OI is diagonal. Here I get say theta of x, and this gives me a di log psi theta of x star, and, D, and this gives me a dj log psi theta of x. So if you want, this is simply the expectation value of x over the usual probability distribution of the i log psi the j log psi okay so if you want this is in another sense this can be written as uh, jacobian dagger jacobian The other term is uh, psi theta o i dagger h psi theta. 
I will define this to be named fi. And by pulling the same, by doing the same trick as of inserting here an identity, this becomes say theta o i dagger x, x h say theta. I divide by x say theta. I multiply by x say theta. And I get something that looks like sum over x say theta of x square of the i log psi star x times e log theta of x. And so if you recall, well, I delete, no, this is exactly the gradient of the energy. Well, I, without the covariance terms uh, that uh, would arise because of a normalization that I didn't include in the calculation this time. But you can believe me that essentially, so this is OI, E log is this term, and the, o, the normalization terms of was minus expectation value of E, minus expectation value of I arise if you if you carry around the normalization expanded to first order. Okay, so essentially what I've done has, is to show that if you solve this set of equation, sum over Ij, Sij, delta theta j equal Fi. Okay, if you solve this set of equation and find the, the delta theta j, that, that solves it, then what you have is you've successfully projected your variation your dynamics in the Hilbert space down to the down to the variational space. So in a sense, like operatively, what it means is you start with a set of parameters theta zero. You generate a set of samples xi from psi theta zero square, yes? Uh, uh, why is there is also the summation over i? I, I, would, uh, I would have said that it's just uh, like component-wise uh, e equality. What do you mean? Uh, I was never writing it, but if you want, here I, it was uh, implicit. Ah, sorry, no, it's j. Ah, okay, okay. Perfect. Indeed. Okay, sorry. Thank you. There was a question? No, okay. Okay, so the operatively the algorithm would be, we start with a set of parameters theta zero, so an initial state. We we take Xi, we, uh, we generate a set of samples with Marco chain Monte Carlo sampling or, or over uh, more refined techniques. We compute S i j so this matrix we compute f j so f f i so the gradient of the energy and uh, uh, this uh, s matrix and then we solve uh, we find delta theta zero which is at least uh, symbolically the pseudo inverse of s times f and now take theta one to be theta zero plus delta theta zero, you rinse and repeat, okay? And uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I forgot the delta tau. So the, the steps, the, the size of the steps that you are taking are determined by a delta tau here, right? But that, that arises from this term. So essentially, if you want to take very small steps, you will have to solve this system of equations for a very small delta tau that you put here. Otherwise, you can take a very large delta tau. Okay? So SIJ is a very neat object. It's, uh, so we physicists uh, used to call it uh, the, the S matrix, very original name. Uh, and more recently, we realized that it has a deep connection with uh, the Fisher information matrix we, in, uh, in machine learning. Essentially, this is telling you, if you want, how much every parameter affects, uh, how much changing uh, a, a certain parameter, theta i, will move you in the, in, in, the, in, this, in the Hilbert space. If you want, if you diagonalize the S matrix, 
and you find that all eigenvalues are zero, this means that regardless of what parameter you change in the in in the variational space, you will not you will not be moving in the Hilbert space. In another sense, your parameters are not affecting your uh, your parameterization. If but simple cases are an S matrix which is diagonal, which means that uh, all the parameters don't interact. And in practice, uh, what we find is that the rank of mat of uh, the S matrix can can change. Uh, a lot during an optimization. Now, what is beautiful about this approach is that if we take delta tau to be sufficiently small, then we are guaranteed to an extent to converge to the ground state. So if I if I use this procedure, I am guaranteed to find the ground state assuming I can solve this system of equation, which is not always valid. Because while the S matrix it's a gram matrix, right? Because I can write this as uh, J dagger J. In practice, uh, it's still defined. So while in practice, while it's positive semi-definite, in practice it will have main, since we are operating the neural network in a over-parameterized regime, there are redundant parameters and therefore there will be zero eigenvalues. And uh, yeah, basically this will, this will make solving this uh, system of equations very complicated. We can regularize uh, this uh, S matrix. Uh, this is something that is done uh, very often. We we don't solve the system of equation, but very often we solve this. We very often add a small regularizer a small diagonal regularization to it. But again, finding the ideal um, amount of regularization is a hard problem, okay? So maybe this is a good moment to ask a few questions. What are you using the neural network? No, not so clear for me. Every time I write log uh, psi theta, this is the neural network. So I encode in a neural network the log wave function, the log psi. Okay. And uh, is there any estimate for the convergence? Because you were saying that if the delta t is small enough, then you have the convergence. Is it um, quadratic convergence? Because of the linear, I mean, this is a non-convex optimization problem, right? So you, you. So if you were to do this exactly, so in the Hilbert space uh -huh. without neural networks at all, uh -huh. if we yeah. were just using, uh, oh, do I still have it? Yeah, if I were just uh, solving this uh, thing, if you recall uh, in the proof I did at the beginning, uh, you can see that the overlap with the ground state is increasing exponentially. You can see of it as uh, e to the minus h delta tau, okay? Uh, assuming you have a non-zero overlap with the ground state, imagine that the, the, the epsilon zero, the zero energy is zero, okay? And then all the others are higher. So the, the overlap with the zero energy stays constant, with the, with the ground state stays constant over time, and all the other ones are being suppressed exponentially fast. Do you understand? So if you want, this only works for uh, what in physics we call uh, gapped Hamiltonians. So Hamiltonians that have, where uh, the, there is a finite distance between the ground state and the first excited state. Sorry, the ground state and the first eigenvalue. Okay. So if the if the gap, so this distance goes to zero, then this class of methods uh, do don't do not necessarily work anymore. But essentially, physicists care a lot about uh, we always say but everything is gapped so we say we always try to operate say where maybe the gap is closed and then all our algorithms start to be super expensive but it's very hard to treat uh, gapless uh, zero gap uh, models and so essentially we don't i mean we do but it's uh Sorry. yes uh, can you uh, see again the the link with the fisher information uh, yeah. 
because I, I I haven't. Yeah, I, I didn't show it. I can uh, I can I could show it tomorrow if you want. Ah, okay, no problem. But uh, you can you can literally prove that this object here mm -hmm. is the Fisher information matrix for your neural network uh, for your model. Ah, okay. Assuming an L two norm. I I will show it tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> But if you want the, the S matrix slash Fisher information matrix slash, uh, we call it quantum geometric tensor, has many names. Um, what it's doing, it's uh, the metric tensor in your variational manifold. You can show that. Uh, let's do it here. So if you want, if you take this definition, okay, linearly expanded to first order in delta theta, and you take uh, psi theta plus delta theta, psi theta plus delta theta, and you compute this quantity, I can call it ds square if you like, then you get exactly this object. Minus psi theta, theta. And you get exactly it. So it's like to first order, it's a linearization of a metric tensor around one point uh, around theta. And uh, which is why, um, yeah, which is exactly the definition of the, I mean, it's one of the possible ways to. Yeah, so what is interesting is that for us physicists, the object that is telling us how to perform this uh, imaginary time evolution, and then also the real time evolution. So essentially, if I wanted, I, I will show it very briefly tomorrow, maybe. But um, if you want, if you want to do a real time evolution, to so, so to solve the Schrödinger uh, time evolution equation, you simply have to add an i to to this object here. So if you do all the calculation, you will get a minus i here. And you solve exactly the same equations. Now, the problem is that it's no longer contracting. So you accumulate errors. And uh, and so you cannot regularize, for example. So you cannot add a regularizer, because if you regularize this equation, you are changing the equations that you're solving. And so you're being shot even farther away from where you want. So yeah. Sorry? Man, the normalization is not very important. Uh, so if you want, the, when you treat the normalization, you get uh, that S is not J dagger J, so this O, O, but it's uh, J, like delta J dagger, delta J dagger. So O minus O uh, average O. But I mean, it doesn't matter too much. But so what I find very interesting is the fact that the Fisher information matrix is the object that is encoding the dynamics uh, in, 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 the, in the Hilbert space. So when we do this uh, variational approximation, all the, what, the object that we need to perform a, a unitary time evolution or, or an imaginary time evolution is the Fisher information matrix, which is telling us how the parameters are coupled and so how we must change them to, to best approximate some, some uh, the action of an operator in the Hilbert space. OK. So, um, so I can, so my idea would be to show you a bit how we do this in practice, if you like the idea. Yes, Alessandro, uh, uh, yes, Augusto, sorry. I, it's it's a rare name in Italian. I don't know any Augusto. Like now I know one, but is that the, as far as I know? But okay. So can uh, posso cambiare al, um, al... So maybe I will just say one one last thing. So when you when you do the the evolution uh, that way, so either imaginary or real time evolution, 
one hidden assumption that we are making is that, well, not so hidden, but it was at the beginning I said, well, if I take a small time step d tau, then I will have a small update of my parameters delta theta, right? This was my starting assumption. Well, it turns out that very often this assumption is is wrong. So you might have a very nice, a very smooth dynamics in the Hilbert space that goes from here to here. And you would assume that like in the Hilbert space, at least it's very smooth, but in the variational manifold, so in the space of your parameters, you will be doing something that is crazy. And therefore, one, one problem that happens in practice is that you will need to take tiny steps because you have two competing time scales. One is the time scale dictated by the unitary or by the dynamics in the Hilbert space. And one is the, the one dictated by this linearization of your parameters. So this linearization of the wave function of the neural network. Yeah. So all those notebooks, uh, you find them on, uh, so, uh, on, on my GitHub. If you want, if you type Filippo Vicentini GitHub, uh, there is uh, a folder with, with, a lot of notebooks about uh, doing uh, doing those things. Okay, so um, here I'm using a software that uh, I developed together with Giuseppe over the last uh, three four three years, which is called NetKit, which essentially is uh, is just a Python package that tries to implement uh, tries to make it easier for physicists to work with uh, machine learning tools. Now it's getting easier and easier, but at the beginning we had issues computing gradients of complex functions. Uh, you have to deal with holomorphic and non-holomorphic functions because all those formulas change slightly. You get the extra terms if your function is non-holomorphic. Um, computing with the S matrix uh, efficiently is uh, is uh, is not, I mean, not hard, but not trivial either. And and many physicists want to do physics; they don't want to to implement those codes. You want to do Monte Carlo, Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling efficiently, and that's another Pandora box. So we try to make NetKit as uh, some, let's say, some a toolbox of some pieces that you need. So the, how you encode uh, your operators efficiently, how you encode, uh, uh, how you do Markov chain Monte Carlo efficiently, and we try to present this to the users. So if for some reason you are uh, you like what we were talking about, you can always just download NetKit and uh, you just take some simple system or a more complicated Hamiltonian and you can just write your neural network in, uh, in, in any JAX uh, conforming, uh, let's say, way. And then you can pass it to NetKit and it will run everything for you. That's the idea. So, if you want, the first thing we need to do in general is always we have to define what is our computational basis or our Hilbert space. So now, uh, did I write the Hamiltonian? Yeah. So you remember Giuseppe talked about this, the, the transverse yieldizing model yesterday uh, on Monday, right? So I hope you remember what those uh, symbols mean, right? Sigma i x means it's the operator uh, that, uh, that is uh, 0 1 1 0 acting on a single uh, on a, on a single degree of freedom sigma z z is diagonal and this is uh, i will be trying to find the ground set of this hamiltonian so i i want to do it for 20 spins right so 20 spins this means is, uh, that this is 1d yeah, I, so I I plus one. Yeah, I didn't do yes, the, okay. the Hamiltonian was written for one D. Okay, this is complaining, but it's okay. Um so if so the Hilbert space is this object in NetKit that defines your computational basis. So you can query how how big it is. And uh, yeah, we have uh, slightly over one million entries in our uh, in our uh, Hilbert space, so it's fairly large. And if you want, uh, was uh, was uh, like was access that I always write in my formulas will be was objects. Like for example, the first uh, the first basis element in this space is minus one minus one minus one. The so the first uh, four elements in the computational basis will be all minus one, and the first one will be one. 
etc. So you can order them however you like, but I mean, this is not particularly important, but it's just to show you what is what are those access that I always write and those will be the input to my neural network, okay? So for 20 sites, I will have a, a string. So it, 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 if you want a, a, a string of 20 bits that I feed to my neural network and it gives me as output a, a real or complex number, which is the log wave function. And so if I want the wave function, then I have to exponentiate it. Okay, so well, this is not particularly interesting, but you can also always uh, generate random elements from this basis, uh, like uniformly. I'm using JAX, so I don't want to, I mean, I think you should use JAX as well, but I don't want to talk about JAX. Uh, but essentially, Pierre and GK, what this means is just a way to tell him this is the state of my random, you construct a new random number generator with this seed, zero in this case and I'm asking to generate three random states. So in NetKit, uh, what is beautiful, uh, in my opinion, is that it's very simple to write an Hamiltonian. So I Im import from netkit.operator.spin, I import the sigma x and sigma z, okay, to, to, write, uh, to write my Hamiltonian. And so for the first term, so this sum over i of sigma x uh, i, I, I simply write it like that, like sum of gamma times, let's say, times sigma x and uh, high comma i means sigma x defined on the Hilbert space h i on the side i okay so to give you a, a better idea if I construct uh, if I construct a smaller Hilbert space I will call it uh, h i zero Uh, for uh, let's say two uh, two spins, okay. So the zero five means it's a it's a spin one half, uh, which means that uh, it's minus one and one. If I have a spin one, uh, in for physical reasons, the, the computational basis will be minus one zero one. Spin uh, two would be, I mean, it grows. But so if I if I construct this object and if I now construct sigma x high zero zero, okay. So this is, I mean, it's telling you a bunch of things, but essentially it tells you this is a local operator uh, of uh, dimension two and it's acting on site zero. And if I say instead act on site one, so the pad x i is one, then it acts on one. And I can always, so the way this is represented internally is by storing only, so you remember that those objects are identity, tensor identity, tensor identity, tensor, tensor a matrix acting only on, on few sides, only on the ith side. So instead of having to store an exponentially large matrix, we only store this small matrix and, with, and, and the label of where, where, where we don't have identities. But we can always convert it uh, to a dense representation. So in this case, there are only four sides, so uh, it's relatively easy to see, right? So this is identity tensor uh, 0, 1, 1, 0. But I mean, uh, if you have uh, like if you have uh, more than thirty spins, uh, essentially uh, more than twenty five spins, it's usually impossible to 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 store in memory the the dense matrix that uh, that represents those objects. Okay, and and then you can always add, for example, you can always add uh, a constant, a scalar, which uh, assumes you are adding it as a times identity, right? And you can also take the, the product of two operators. So if you remember, sigma x uh, is 0, 1, 1, 0. So the square of sigma x is the identity, right? And you can also take the product of two operators on two different sides. Uh, I mean, you can just compose them as you want. So he understands that the multiplication is like the matrix product. The, yeah, the so the multiplication is actually a... It, is by, it has worked well, so... <laughs> yes. Okay, okay. Okay, so now here I'm summing all those terms. And so uh, we can see that H now, you see, we, is a local operator with 20, uh, acting on a space with 20 sides. And we have 20 terms, okay? 
And, the, and this is like, while these objects should be huge, we are just storing 20 two by two matrices and 20 scalars telling uh, indices, knowing to know where it is. And then the, the, the sigma z, z term is implemented by simply doing sigma z i times sigma z i plus one, okay? And so now we have 40 terms, right? So 20 sigma z i, sigma z i plus one and 20 local terms. Okay, so in general, like 20 sites is not too large, so I can uh, use exact diagonalization, means I, meaning I can convert H to a sparse matrix and I can use uh, uh, Langsos or whatever uh, SciPy implements uh, to find the ground states. So the lowest level, the lowest line I can say, it. so this is what what I'm doing here. Of course, uh, it's two to the 20, right? One million. So it's a sparse matrix of one million times one million. So it takes a bit, I mean, a few seconds on my laptop, if I have enough memory available. And, but, and eventually this should, yeah. So this run, you see he constructed this one million by one million matrix. And now SciPy will take a while. Of course, the point is that as physicists, we are always interested in studying very large systems because all our claims are uh, in what we call the thermodynamic limit. So in the limit of uh, infinitely many uh, spins, infinitely many degrees of freedom, because uh, I mean, matter uh, is not made of 20, 20 atoms, right? <laughs> it's made of millions of atoms. So we want to find what are the properties of matter when, when there's a lot of it. O often, not always. Um, and 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 so the objective of, of physicists is really like this quest of finding polynomial time algorithms uh, to 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 study the larger and larger systems and be able to do some scaling and say look if we extrapolate uh, we can say that uh, this is, those are the properties yes sorry uh, like uh, I've always like been curious about the, uh, this thing like how uh... Computationally speaking, like how big do you have to go until you see a convergence to the proper thermodynamic limit? Like so, this is where physical intuitions come into play, and essentially, it's when you have to uh, do a trade-off between uh, uh, what you, the simulations you can run and the regime where you start to see where finite size effects start to disappear, and yeah. you start to see the, the some some interesting properties. So, for example, for, I mean, uh, when I uh so computation for the classical easy model like uh, with uh, a square dimension i don't know like 2000 times 2000 you already see like a proper convergence uh, no okay so in quantum mechanics, quantum mechanics uh, it's or... very rare for people to simulate systems of more than it depends what but so in one dimensional systems we have very powerful techniques so maybe we can do a thousand mm, sites okay. but in two dimensions for example in general Nobody has simulated uh, systems that are more than a hundred sites okay. on hard problems where you cannot apply some over approximations or very very specific tools. Okay. Um, yeah. So I would argue that it's around one hundred uh, the limit the with limit. with approximate technique. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. I mean, then there are there is always uh, there, the the typical approach of physicists is to say, okay, so. My, I will I will treat one part of my system classically where I can do thousands easily and then I will treat one part uh, quantum mechanically and then the way you cut in you separate the classical from a quantum part uh, it's it's uh, it's an important part of your approximation and uh, it affects your result because it's not a controlled approximation anyway so I'm a bit out of time, but we started later, right? So I, I get uh, 10 extra minutes. <laughs> so for example, the, the, the single most uh, beloved uh, approximation by physicists is the mean field ansatz, which uh, if you want, so, okay. Um, yeah, I don't have it, but. But then they tell me it's not recorded. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, no, but yeah, no, it's good like this. Uh, anyway, um, so what I want to say is this. So the complexity in quantum mechanics lies in the fact that uh, our Hilbert space, so our vector is growing exponentially, okay, in the number of particles. So classically, 
if you have uh, n classical spins, right, n classical bits, uh, your system is fully de is fully described by 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 a bit, right? Zero, zero, one, zero, whatever. This fully describes the, the configuration of your system. You don't need to know anything else. If you have this, you have a snapshot of a system, you have all the information you need. And so adding, like doubling the system size, it's just a matter of taking a longer a longer bit string. And then you have to compute some quantities with your Hamiltonian, etc. But But this it describes all the information you need. Instead, in quantum mechanics, we have a, we have a wave function, right? So we have this object, which is the sum of some coefficients of C, let's say, uh, how do you say, it? bit one, bit two, bit n, sum over b1, b2, bn, times b1, bn. So now, if you want, the full information is encoded into two to the power of n complex numbers. Okay, so what can I do to make this easier? What, what is the difference between classical and quantum? The difference uh, is that, at least, or how can I make the quantum description more akin to the classical? So one thing I can say is that this, this is separable, we say. So that I have C of B1, C of B2, C of B3, Okay, if I do this approximation, then I don't need the two to the n numbers anymore. I only need two times n complex numbers, right? So if you want what I'm doing here, I'm having a quantum mechanical description inside of a single bit. So I don't have a bit, I have a qubit. But I, 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 I'm, I'm saying that there are no quantum mechanical effects between two qubits, okay? And and this is lowering my complexity a lot. So the mean field ansatz, the single most beloved ansatz of all physicists in history, is doing this, is saying, look, there is some quantum mechanical effect on a single spin. Uh, there is some quantum mechanics involved, but very little, because two different spins, they don't talk quantum mechanics. They, they only talk classical mechanics between them, OK? And so, I mean, by if you want, by assuming that your um that all the that the system is translational invariant so i mean that all those coefficients c b1 b2 etc are the same okay and assuming that uh, this uh, that essentially this means that you are taking for your state some uh we can write it like this like like this uh let's say phi 1 times phi 2 times phi three, et cetera, okay? Where this now acts only on, on, on a single uh, degree of freedom, on a single spin. If you assume normalization, right? Like you see here, then you have a single degree of freedom. You have a single, uh, and if you assume it's real as well, I'm doing a lot of assumptions, but essentially you have a single uh, number, lambda, okay? Yes? So it's different from the mean field, like in the classical case, where actually you, you basically say that your, everything is encoded in the magnetization of, so you only have one scalar. This is exactly that. But you still have like mm, two times n degrees of freedom. So like you have, you are making the spins not interacting. No, wait, well, it's two times n because I have two on every spin mm -hmm. times n because I have n spins. If okay. you assume uh, homogeneous uh, translational invariant, so a homogeneous uh, state, mm -hmm. so then it's only two, right? Ah, okay, okay, okay. Then because ah, okay. So if you... so in the case two per two times n is like c one b one c two b two. Yes. But then if you are homogeneous, uh, that they are uh, indistinguishable, okay. and then there is C something. Okay. Yeah, then they are all the same. Okay, so if, if you're on inv traditional invariant, it's exactly the same as in the classical cases. So yes. Sense. Okay. 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 Thank you. For, for spins, if you have, uh, like, for spin one half, if you have a larger uh, 
Hilbert space locally, then uh, it, it starts to deviate slightly from the classical picture because you start to account for quantum mechanical effects locally. So if you want like one, like the generalization of mean field uh, in physics is called, uh, um, it has many names. Uh, I call it Goodswiller mean field. Some other people call it uh, plug entangled plaquette states. And the idea is to start to encode uh, quantum mechanical effects only on the short range. So you have something like C1, B1, B2, C2, uh, B3, B4. So if you want, what you are doing is instead of, if those are your spins, right? Instead of encoding quantum mechanically only the single spin, you encode a small plaquette quantum mechanically, like the full wave function inside of here, but then you assume that between two plaquettes, you only have classical interactions and the way how you choose the plaquettes, if they overlap or not, uh, this is, I mean, it's, it was a field of active research in computational physics. It, it still is, and it's where your knowledge driven by the physical principles helps you. Anyway, so I, I, mean field, I will just show that. Uh, essentially, we have a single parameter, like the lambda, which essentially gives you the magnetization here. And uh, we can take our mean field model, right? I said that uh, we are encoding the logarithm of a wave function. So I could say that my neural network, my super complicated neural network with one parameter is giving me the, is giving me the logarithm of this probability. It, essentially, it's encoding the probability to be up or down, okay? So this is using flux, which is uh, one framework to define neural networks with, uh, with JAX. You can pretty much use what you want, but in short, if you want, what is going on here is I'm defining the parameter lambda to be initialized with a Gaussian at the beginning. It's a single parameter and it's a floating point number, okay? And then the, the, the output of my neural network is computed by taking the log sigmoid of lambda times x, okay? So it's implementing this function here. This is element-wise, right? Because Python loves uh, doing element-wise operations. And then I simply sum along uh, all the i's. Since I'm working in log space, since uh, this is the log wave function, the sum over the i's means that I'm taking the product in the wave function. Does it make sense? OK. So in the way that, uh, that those things work in uh, in, in, in JAX is that you would con construct this, uh, this object, mean field, then you can do init, I think. Yes, you can do init. You, you pass him uh, a random, a pseudo random number generator, and you pass it uh, a, um, a, a state. Or, yeah. And so essentially, if you want, when you pass it a state, it, it knows what size the input should be. And so it knows, uh, it compiles everything inside and it finds out how it should be. This is particularly nice for, uh, I don't know, dense uh, layers where you don't have to define how large is the input size. You can always compute the output size, even the input size. Okay. And then, yeah, in Netcat, right, we implement those, uh, those samplers, like Metropolis Local which Metropolis Local is uh, doing Markov chain Metropolis sampling with a local transition rule. Essentially, uh, what it does is that you start from a configuration, let's say all spins down, it, it, uh, it flips one spin, so you have all spins down and the last is up, and it checks if this configuration is more probable as a higher psi square than the previous one, and if it is, he accepts it. If it's not, I mean, he uses the... Uh, the, the 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 metropolis acceptance rule yeah metropolis hastings acceptance rule to decide whether to accept it or not and then uh yeah so if you want to use this uh, what you could do is simply say um sampler dot initialize state i don't remember what he wants he wants uh, the mean field model. He wants your model and uh, the parameters, right? So I can take the parameters by initializing it. 
So this is constructing a metrop metropolis sampler state that I have to carry around. So I, I call this sampler state. Okay. And then what you can do is simply So when you have to reset it, it's uh, pretty much the same thing. And then you can run, we can do sampler state two samples, sampler dot sample J. Samples. Uh, mean field model bars state equal sampler state and chain length equal 100. Uh, ah, yes, I know. Um, what is the name? I don't remember. Well, we can do sample next. Sorry. Okay. So this is doing one step in the Markov chain. Okay. Uh, and so you would have. So here you have a sampler. Yeah. So this would be sampler state and samples. So the sampler stage keeps uh, the random number generation and a bunch of things inside. And the samples here is just this batch. We have 16 Markov chains and you see that, I mean, they're all, uh, they all contain some information. So this way, if you just want some samplers that you can differentiate through, etc., this is nice to use. But in general, what we say is just use this variational state, which is a, essentially is a neural network quantum state, is an object that is hiding all the details from, from physicists in general. You just say, what is your sampler? What is your model? And how many samples you want to compute quantities? And uh, and then you can use it. Essentially, it initialize the, state, the variational state for you. You can look at parameters. You can, you can look at the samples, blah, blah, blah. And the nice thing is that you can compute expectation values. And this will do it for you. Essentially, computes the expectation value by doing, I mean, which is in this case 20. It computes the error. It computes uh, some estimators that tell you if you are converging or not. And uh, it gives you the correlation length and a bunch of other things. Well, so I don't want to go over time. So I will just I will skip this. If you are interested in the things we do, you can go through this notebook. Tomorrow it will be mainly notebook. So. I, we will do something more, but uh, what is what I wanted to show you is that in practice, yeah, this is the variational Monte Carlo algorithm that Giuseppe presented on Monday. It's a, on Monday essentially, the f we in a for loop we compute the expectation value and the gradient of the energy. Uh, yeah, we store the energy, the value of the energy somewhere, and we and if you want, we update our parameters with the old parameters. So we do, this is just a fancy way to operate on uh, trees, on dictionaries of parameters, but essentially it's uh, doing X minus 0 0.05 times gradient for every set of parameter, okay? And then it's uh, substituting the parameters at every step. So now if I plot, uh, um, if I plot the energy, uh, if I plot the energy, see that we are going down. Okay. And if we plot, uh, um, the ground state energy. Uh, x min equals zero, x max hundred. You can see that it's not very good because this is a mean field approximation. So we are using one parameter. Okay, 
So I will just flash this. Uh, we can. So what we can do is um, we can use some better uh, variational state. So I can, for example, do this state equal netcat eqs.mc state. So this mc state is this black box that hides away all the details. Um, with this sampler, and now as a model, I will take uh, an RBM with uh, parameter density one, for example. And uh, yeah, everything else by default. And now if I take 300 steps, I think. This is getting down much better. And uh, yeah, and tomorrow I will show you that by using this imaginary time evolution technique, we can go down even better and we can much more fastly converge. Maybe I will just show you a plot. No, I don't have it, so I will not show it. I will finish here. So it's my pleasure to give you the floor to Alexandro Houdi. So we can continue his, <laughs> so thank you, Alessandro. So yesterday we've done, uh, let's say, a short presentation on the, the, the goal of the next uh, classes. Uh, so we have seen uh, a bit of a program with some, uh, some stated theorems. And so uh, in this class and in the next uh, two, one, two, I would say, uh, we are going to to prove some of the results we have seen. No? Uh, it will be, a, I would say, a fun journey in uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces and uh, some uses we can do with them. That, that are, uh, if you want, quite creative with respect to the standard things you have seen. So there could be some results uh, that you could like and reuse somewhere else, maybe. So we'll do a short recap of air Reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. Okay. Then uh, we will do some examples. So once we have these, we just recall one second uh, how can you define interesting operators? So linear operators. And then we define the PSD models we have seen uh, yesterday, but in directly on RKHS. <laughs> and basic properties. So then we can follow the, uh, well, uh, if you are more algorithmic or more uh, uh, analytic, we can do either uh, the representer theorem, representer theorem and then algorithms, or approximation results. So how good are those functions, uh, those, uh, those models to approximate uh, non-negative functions, okay? It was uh, the other aspect we were seeing. And so let's say that on one side, so we have, uh, okay, let's do it here. So on one side, then we have, uh, uh, let's say, algorithms. And so we have, um, uh, we start with the representer theorem. It is a generalization of the representer theorem for this kind of models. So maybe we can recall one second. And uh, what else? Well, I would say, and then we can directly, for example, prove at this point uh, the uh, the result on non-convex optimization. We have almost all the elements except the rates of convergence. Then instead, so let's say, uh,
And then we have instead, let's say, up the approximation theory. path that brings us to um, so well I would say some we recall one second um, it's a interpolation results for RKHS And then uh, we can extend it extension to PSD model. And once we have this, we can uh, complete uh, the proof. Okay. And uh, here in the interpolation results for RKHS, we will prove, for example, the, the result for Sobolev spaces that you can approximate uh, a sobole function with error epsilon if you have uh, epsilon minus d over uh, m minus d over two um, points, for example. I don't know if you have ever seen this. Uh, we will do it. We can, uh, you can prove it uh, with different degrees of generality. I would say uh, relatively easy proof is uh, if you take a grid of points. So you, you, and we will use the fact that uh, we have a, uh, we are, we are on a lattice. Okay, so uh, let me, let's start. Questions so far? Okay, so I'm just recalling some background uh, uh, material that was covered, I imagine, by the previous speakers who was before Lorenzo, Silvia, Ernesto, Saveri. Ernesto was here too. Wow. Okay. So we have a space of what is a RKHS? So we have a space of function H that is a subset of uh, some function from X to a space X to let's say complex numbers. Okay. X here is just a set, okay? You don't need much more. Um, this space H has some interesting properties. So first, it is a Hilbert space of functions. So it means that it is ended by with a, a inner product, okay? And then it, ar it arrives together with a, a map. It is called uh, in machine learning feature map, but for us it's just a map from X to H. Okay, so such that so for each point X in the space gives you a um, a function in H. Okay, and this is called the um, so it plays the role of the uh, if you want the uh, evaluation functional. Okay. And so the property you need to consider here is that uh, for any function f in h, you have that uh, the evaluation of f in, e in x and for any x in x can be written as the inner product of f with respect to the evaluation functional in x. Okay, and this tells you also that uh, the evaluation here is, uh, um, so it is a functional that is always bounded for any X. Okay, so those are, so it is rather abstract if you want, but this is the beauty of this construction because uh, you can apply to many, many spaces. So there are, few space few uh, hilbert spaces of functions that, that are not rkhs okay and uh, i guess we can already uh, so there are a few ways to build uh, an rkhs maybe you want to start from a list of, from a basis that you like you could start from another map you can start from what is called kernel what is the kernel? Well, you see here, 
So any function in H can be evaluated by using the evaluation functional. It is another function in H. So if you see there is a, a kind of interesting situation when you want to evaluate the evaluation functional itself, okay? And so uh, what happens if you do this? Okay, we say that the evaluation functional is a function, so we can evaluate it, and this is called kernel. The beauty of this construction is now that uh, uh, all the properties of your space H are, are the, um, controlled by the feature map, but itself, uh, the feature map can be expressed with respect to the kernel, because you see the feature map in X prime is a function that can be defined as X prime, the kernel function in X prime X, okay? So if you want, uh, can you write explicitly this map? Yes, this map is uh, phi of x prime is the function k x prime dot. Okay. And so here you see that, so we have three elements where two are fundamental. So either you have H and phi and you build K or vice versa, you have K and the inner product and you can build phi with this identity. Okay, so. Okay, so let's. Uh, Okay, so let's give some examples. So for example, now we consider some Hilbert spaces built using translation invariant kernels. Okay. So we have fa the function, uh, so H, well, in general, is given by all the functions F, let's say from uh, R to the D to C. Okay, such that uh, and so we define an inner product. Okay. So what is this? So we take two functions and the inner product between the two, those, those two functions in H is given by the, if you want, the L2 of the Fourier transform weighted by this function K. Okay, and this is the function that will generate your kernel. Okay, so now let's try to, so given this inner product, let's try to build the kernel. So what is the property we are looking for? We are looking for a function such that must have this property. So what does it mean? It means that we must have X prime dot K dot X prime equal to K X X prime. Okay, so given this, well, I already gave the right na name to this, so uh, you can guess uh, what we're going to build, but uh, so given the inner product and the property we are looking for, we can build the kernel. Okay, so this could be, if you never did it, uh, could be a nice exercise to do. Okay, and so which function, uh, so which function can we consider? Well, let's consider this function here, for example. Okay. 
uh, that is written as uh, okay so now we can see that uh, so what is it? Well, if you want, this is, uh, you see, it's just the Fourier transform. Okay. And uh, no. And you see that we can verify very easily that the equality. So we have uh, so the Fourier transform of this is exactly this one. So it is. Uh, Call it. Uh, um, so this is the Fourier transform of the first uh, of the first one. Where did I put the conjugate? Is here. Okay. Then you have the Fourier transform of the second one. Um, Okay, this one and this one simplify, and then you have that is exactly k of x prime minus x. So you see that this one is indeed the kernel for this space of functions. So you can represent compactly this space of functions by using the, the, the space of functions uh, that are all the functions uh, the, for which the inner pro the, the, the norm defined by the inner product is finite by using this kernel. So what does it mean that for all those functions you have that f of x is just f k of x k. Sorry. Yes. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> um, I, 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 not quite getting the the notation. Like, how does this thing work? Like, the x prime minus dot is mm -hmm. like adding a var a variable, like a muted variable y, and then, like, so. yeah. So this is a constant. Okay. K x x prime is a constant, mm -hmm. and this is a function in the muted variable. But so when you compute the Fourier transform, like it should be like x prime minus dot transpose, right? Well, the Fourier transpose is in, is in the dot. Okay, okay. So you so, so you have, uh, if you have the function, uh, uh, let's say, if you have the function z, okay, mm -hmm. you can write it as the integral of k at uh, uh, omega, then probably I will get wrong with the minus here, but let's say that uh, this is okay. Okay, so this is your function. Here, you are translating it by minus x. So the Fourier transform for this one is, uh, you know, that... Uh, 
Okay, so it's like a muted variable you added. Yeah, so this is the muted variable okay. z and the minus x is the constant. So you want here for any x prime and x, the, your definition of inner product and kernel gives you that for the two functions where you fixed the, the um, x prime and x, you will obtain again the kernel. Okay. 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 Okay, in the definition of the uh, product, product uh, k x prime uh, mm -hmm. dot, the second is k dot x or x prime? Uh, On, uh, oh, yes, uh, here, sorry. As x. I, I... Okay, perfect. Yes, yes. Thanks. Oh, thanks. You have a question? No. You were just doing, ah, okay. <laughs> It was bothering you there. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. So this is an example. Of course, you need, I mean, to define this properly, you need some properties. And one is, uh, the crucial one is that your, this function k hat is always non-negative. Okay. Clearly. I, I'm still not getting these. Because uh, like if you you do like, uh, x prime minus z you have like minus 2 pi i minus z which is plus z and then on so the, the on Fourier the... transform here so I, I removed the wrong part so this is for k for this one is what is uh, so the Fourier transform if you want uh, so yeah. the Fourier transform of this. Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is fine for me. It's it's uh, the top, the the upper line, like the one where you can. No, but let's let's write it explicitly and then uh, modulo some error on the sign. Uh, it will. Uh... So this one should be something like. Uh... So this is the dot. This is the variable in which you are taking the Fourier transform, and this should be something like uh, two pi i x transpose. Uh... Omega. You get the translation. So the translation in Fourier is uh, the fact that you are multiplying the Fourier transform times uh, the, the 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 complex exponential. No. Okay. And that's it. And then this is why you have this. You have this. But look at this point. Uh, you can uh, uh, gather with respect to omega, and you obtain x minus x, okay. x prime minus x. Okay. I think now. Okay. Okay, so this is uh, inside k hat, there is already a Fourier transform of the k x prime. Okay, okay. Exactly. So now you do. How, you, how it is defined? You take f, you take g, you take the Fourier transform of f, the Fourier transform of g, you do the, two, the weighty del 2, and that's the result. Okay. And Thank so you. the Fourier transform of f is k with the translation. So it's. Uh, um, the Fourier transform OK times, times is uh, OK. Is, OK, no, I, I was a little bit OK. Thank you. OK. So, this is a very interesting example because already here you can represent many spaces of interest depending on the definition of K hat. Yes. I think it's a stupid question. We define the I, K. I'm happy because I can answer. So. <laughs> We define k x prime minus x, yes. the integral of uh, e alla 2 pi Greek. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, in uh, under, we define k the x prime minus x, uh, e alla minus 2. I y. told you already that surely I put the signs wrong somewhere. So, ah, okay. But you can do the same proof. Oh, I, I invite you to do the same proof, putting the right signs everywhere, and it will work. Okay. Um, so you can already control many interesting spaces by by this construction, depending on the choice you do of k hat. Let's cover, for example, Sobolev spaces. That, who knows Sobolev spaces? I guess all of you, right? You don't. Okay, perfect. This gives me the 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 the, the idea of talking about Sobolev spaces. So let's. Let's see. Let's recall very briefly. Uh, 
Okay. So let's define the space W M2 over R to the D. Okay. As all the, spa, the function F. Okay. Such that you have. Uh, how do I put the coefficients? Well, okay, so we can do like this. Okay, so you take uh, uh, so all the derivatives up to order m yeah, are bounded. Okay, that's it. That's all bullet spaces. Super easy. You are just so each each um, each derivative. So a function f admits weak derivatives up to order m, and those are uh, square integrable. And this is the the two here. This Square integrability is because I put the two here. Of course, you can do LP if you want, but we will not do. LM, what do you mean? It is a Hilbert space, indeed. Exactly. So it's not only the function itself, but also its derivatives must be. Exactly. This is the space. Okay, this is the space uh, you will need. And the cool thing here is that uh, not only you can write it uh, in terms of the function itself and its derivatives, but here you have L2, you have derivatives. Everything here works well with Fourier transform. So you can write the same space, the same requirements in terms of a Fourier transform. Okay. Exactly. So there are uh, other spaces. So all the spaces of this form actually. So if you want this k controls the derivatives, okay. So um, we can talk about it. So de depending on the on the properties and the derivatives you want. Uh, so this one. So you can use classical results from uh, Fourier transform. You can write it as the L two. Uh, of the Fourier transform of this, no? So this one. What is the Fourier transform of this? Okay, so there are constants like pi's somewhere, or maybe not because I used the two pi notation. Well, let's assume not. No, I'm sure there are. Okay, so you see that uh, uh, Planck theorem, no, the one that allows you to to write the Fourier transform of uh, Fg as so. So you just use the fact that the Fourier transform is a unitary operator of L2, and so you write uh, F, uh, so if you want, uh, Fg in L2 equal equally as F uh, uh, since F is unitary, and so.
So at this point, you see that your derivative in Fourier becomes a, a weighting factor. And now you can gather all the weighting factors together. Okay. And so this becomes... Uh, uh, to alpha indeed. Um, okay. Well, here you should put uh, the right coefficient that uh, maybe is with the two. Ah, no, it's without the tune. It's perfect. Okay, so we have this. Okay, and uh, so here alpha is a multi-index, of course, right? And so if you see this, uh, this is uh, just the ex expansion of this uh, one plus uh, the components of omega to the square to power m that is... Uh, one plus uh, omega power two to power power m, okay? And so you can write this equivalently Or if you want, uh, as a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, uh, as the one that we defined before, with the k of omega, that is uh, k omega equal to one over one plus uh, omega square m. And this is the kernel associated to the reproducing, to the um, uh, to the sobol of space uh, WM2. Sorry? K, K headless. And uh, that's it. So if you want to work on those spaces, you don't have to do crazy stuff. You can just uh, cast the problem in terms of uh, uh, reproducing Karen Hilbert space, and you gain two things. The fact that uh, you have all the properties you want that are known on Sobolev spaces, and also your proof can be generalized to all the other producing Karen Hilbert spaces. Okay. And uh, yeah, this one is, is known in closed form. The, the Fourier transform of this, it is the, the Bessel K function. So you can really compute it in practice if you want. Yes. And that the, um, so having weak derivatives amount to the Fourier, Fourier transform decaying fast enough? Exactly. So this means that the Fourier transform has to decay at least. Uh, so you see, you are yeah, you're multiplying, uh, yeah. you are adding this okay. weight. So it means that the Fourier transform has to decay okay. with a given speed. But this is already well known in uh, the Fourier transform uh, setting. You know, that, okay. uh, I was not in the Fourier transform setting. That's what okay, I, I uh, so, so this is... A, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 
So, so if you want, the kernel there tells you exactly how fast the, the tails of the Fourier transform should go to zero. Okay, thanks. That corresponds to controlling the, the, the degree of differentiability, if you want. So the differentiability properties of your function. Okay, so this is in R to the D. You can do the, let's say, the identical construction in, uh, for example, on the on the torus. So I can ask just so. Yes. But this is not always a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, right? It so... is a reproducing kernel Hilbert space where when you can. So, what is a crucial property of a kernel that you can evaluate it in every point? Okay. So it must me mean that the the um, uh, transform must give you a function that is defined everywhere. Okay. And if you take uh, m smaller than d over 2, your function diverges in 0. So it's not a kernel for, for r to the d. Okay. And so this is the limit indeed that corresponds to, uh, well, the limit of uh, uh, the, 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 the embedding of Sobolev spaces, Sobolev spaces in L infinity. No? So you have that uh, WMP, okay. Uh, is a subset of L infinity when uh, so M is larger than D over P. And in this case, indeed, so what does it mean? It means that this also means that this um, uh, K must be um, L1, so integrable. Yes. I'm, I'm not getting uh, my own now, finally. <laughs> it, uh, I'm not getting like, I, I mean, if this is the, the like what, what what we have written in the in the, um, in the first blackboard is that basically our constraint in terms of the definition of the space can be written as a proper weight of the Fourier transform mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. our function, right? Yes. But uh, how does this, which I mean, somehow to me makes sense uh, in this um, when thinking about K as a, somehow a kernel, right? In, mm -hmm. the, in this, but how can I come back to the uh, the fact that I want to evaluate then my 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 function in a point from this KW? I'm not getting this. Like when I have the K hat of W, is something that is defined in the, in the Fourier space, right? So yes, if I want to uh, then evaluate my my function f on the on the on the RD. What should I do? Like, so, well, this depends. How do you know your function? Which is which is the shape of your function? Okay. Oh, okay. So, in general, if your function is uh, well, okay. if you have your so, in which form do you have your function? Can you already evaluate it or not? What do you know about your function? No, oh, um, I mean, I I would really like to to have a k of x prime x, and now I have a k of w. So like I I cannot understand how to relate those what is things. K, okay, sorry, what is K, okay. yeah, the the definition of the kernel like which is a, a two variable function. This one. K. Oh, oh oh okay so it's the uh, okay. uh, this is the kernel this is the definition. Oh so I see. the goal here is uh, we want uh, we are looking for a function with this property. In a context where the inner product is defined like this. Okay, which no, is I the see. function that satisfies this? Does it exist? And the answer is yes. It is written like this. And mm -hmm. you can do it in closed form. Okay. If you are able okay. to compute this integral. For example, okay. if you choose k hat, so it's a whole, if you want to okay. work with uh, Sobolev spaces, then your k hat will be this function. And in, in, uh, in, uh, in Fourier, that mm -hmm. corresponds to this function in... Uh, so you do, you do the... Uh, the Fourier transform, you obtain the kernel. Okay. Oh, now I see. So the 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 flow of thought is that we we start with h being f of R D to C. We start by with some properties. With In some particular, properties. for example, you want to control the 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 well the differentiation properties. Okay. okay. The the 
for example, here mm -hmm. you want that it is at least uh, m times differentiable. Okay, so yeah. we 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 actually found the, the the form of the kernel in terms of this Fourier transform. So now we take as an example the the Sobolev space. We show that the constraint of the Sobolev space can be reflected on the constraints on the Fourier transform, and now we come back, we put this exactly. there, and we have the kernel. Okay. Exactly. Thank and you. this allows you also to, for example, represent function with the representer theorems that you have seen uh, with, uh, with Ernesto and, uh, and Saverio. Uh, so you can solve a problem over Sobolev spaces where you know you, you fix the, the, the evaluation of your functions in some point. You can find which is the minimum norm Sobolev functions that fits your points. And it will be something of this form. Uh, no, the, the, the representer theorem you have seen. So if you have a, a functional uh, of this form, So now you can solve it uh, in closed form. You know that the solution lives in the span. So this is equivalent so plus regularization if you want. Okay. You know that the solution lives in the span of uh, uh, Now you solve this problem in alpha, in the coefficients alpha, and you can express your solution explicitly. Yes. Well, two questions. The first is with the definition of the Sobolev norm. Mm -hmm. that, I don't know, is it not the standard construction with this binomial coefficient, right? Are, are the equivalent norms to just taking coefficient one? So I the, choose, the uh, uh, well, of course, uh, so. I choose this. Uh, so why your, your question is why I put yeah, this, yeah, because well, I put this, like this to, this to have equality. Right? But at this point, uh, if you find equivalent norms where here you put one, you can do upper and lower bounds that will be in the order of the maximum of the order, yeah, yeah, let's exactly. say by one of this constant. So in the order of uh, M to the D. Yeah, yeah. My question was just if they were equivalent. And the other one, can, can you explain again how how is that if m is smaller than d half, then you have this this singularity around zero that you mentioned? Well, because because you want your kernel, sorry, your kernel must be an evaluation functional for a, for each point in x. So in also it must be the evaluation functional of the kernel, the kernel evaluated in x in x. So this means that. Uh, x, y must be smaller than infinity. Let's say for any x and y in x. Okay. And uh, if you take, uh, I mean, a, a direct way to see this is taking the Fourier transform of this. So seeing the function, the kernel. And you see that this, um, if you do k, x, x, that corresponds to taking the Fourier transform this in zero. Okay, this one diverges when you take, uh, uh, yes, when you take m small, smaller or equal to d over 2. This corresponds uh, to the, and so there is, uh, there, are, there are a couple of points where the, the, um, the evaluation function diverges, so it is not, I mean, the construction does not hold anymore. Yeah, yeah, I see. Okay. Thank you. And uh, well, you can see this also. Well, you can do more generally considerations over the fact that you need the Fourier transform that is uh, L1. Okay. Because in any case, this space must be a subset of L2. Okay. So you need your function to be square integrable. Okay. Um, I guess, uh, so this to say that it, uh, this construction allows you to really to work on over Sobolev spaces just by using the, the, the representer techniques that you've seen in uh, for kernel methods. 
So just one second, let's say that we can do the same construction also on the torus, that is the one we are going to use later. And so again, we do another construction that is uh, analogous and we take uh, F that are on the torus. So let's say they will write it like this. F is okay on the... 0, 1 to the D, periodic, okay, and we have also that uh, uh, now we take the Fourier series associated to F, and we ask again, and so the construction is exactly the same, but instead of the integral, now we have a sum over the Fourier, co uh, the Fourier coefficient, and so if you want, uh, we have something like this. Okay, so this is the, the inner product that we consider. And the kernel, again, we do the same construction. It will be something like... Uh, Uh, yes. Then, of course, the interesting thing is, uh, so you have the se se same identical property. So uh, you can represent the uh, Sobole functions, Sobole periodic function, or if you want the Sobole functions over the torus. So WM2 periodic. Okay. That are exactly the same definition, but just over over uh, over the periodic functions. Uh, so there are equivalent to a Hilbert space with the kernel. Okay. It has the same definition that we have written there. So, and with KL now that is uh, uh, one over, you can write it in many equivalent way. One is, uh, uh, let's say this one. Okay. Because again, you are controlling how the uh, the derivatives of your function uh, behave. Okay, that's it. So those are, let's say, uh, well, the one on R to the D is the one maybe you are more familiar with. And uh, this one is the equivalent over the periodic function is the one we are going to consider in our, uh, so we will do examples uh, over this space because uh, controlling the uh, approximation properties of functions that are over the torus is easier. You don't have to take care of boundary conditions and so on. So you can do it in class, let's say. Those so how much? Okay, so we have half hour. Well, perfect. So we did uh, RKHS, we did examples. Let's recall one second. Uh, basic properties of linear operators that we need, and then we define PSD models.
Ok, so... so we de define the space of symmetric linear operators over H, okay, so such that uh, uh, we give a norm. Yes, so I put the Hilbert Schmidt here for simplicity, okay. And so we define uh, uh, so A star linear operators from H to H such that uh, so they are Hermitian and the Hilbert Schmidt norm is uh, finite. The Hilbert Schmidt norm you can so one of the easiest uh, and corresponds to the trace of a star a okay and so this space is also a, a hilbert space given this norm i don't think we are going to use this property but it's good to have maybe towards the end of the of the class. Okay, so this means so your your Hilbert Schmidt. This is also equivalent to say that uh, so your operator is compact, and uh, so it means that uh, it admits uh, a, a negative value decomposition. So each operator here. So this is equivalent uh, to say that uh, uh, well, all the operators here can be defined as. Uh, uh, Okay, so let's fix a notation for the outer product. We can take this one if you, if it's okay for you, such that, uh, so. Okay, so are all the operators that can be written uh, in terms of a basis, so that admit an eigen decomposition and the eigen values are uh, square summable. Okay, this is indeed uh, easy to prove. Okay, so given this, we are going to define our uh, PSD uh, uh, PSD models. So we define here also an additional uh, space. So this HS, uh, I will remove it. Uh, I will just assume to be present everywhere. So oh, simplify a bit the notation. We write this, it is equivalent to this one. Um, so. Okay, with additional properties, it is positive semi-definite. Okay, so we can write it uh, uh, as uh, so. It means that for any vector v in Hilbert, you have v a v non negative. Okay. Okay, that's it. So this is just to fix the notation, and uh, then we can directly define. The VST model. So this is, if you want, uh, another space of function, okay? That corresponds to all the functions. So while the Hilbert space can be written, so if you want, you can write uh, H again as all these functions. So it's equivalent to H can be written as all the function of the form W phi of X. So all the linear models in H. 
such that W is in H, okay? So all the functions in H are uh, linear models with respect to vectors in H, okay? Here we are defining, uh, let's say a higher order uh, construction that we that is the following. We consider functions of the form phi of x, a phi of x with phi with a in um, yes. Okay. This is the space of functions uh, that we are considering. We call the, those uh, PSD models. Because are defined with respect to a PSD matrix, a uh, PSD operator indeed. And uh, let's see some properties, some basic properties of this construction. Okay, we say that A admits a, an eigenvalue decomposition. So any A can be written as lambda J, UJ, UJ transpose, okay? And uh, so let's write for simplicity F of A of X as the inner product we have. You see already that given this definition, if you expand the definition of A in a function from calligraphic F, you have that this function is non negative, and in particular, it can be written as lambda j of x, lambda j times uj of x to square. So it is a sum of squares of functions. Okay, so in particular, it will be non-negative for any x. Okay, so if you want the first property, and this, is, this was the, the originating property we were looking for, is uh, non-negativity. So this function by construction is non-negative everywhere. Linearity, okay, it's linear in A. And, uh, I guess uh, this is clear from the formula. And uh, so an important property that we have to prove is the fact that uh, it is amenable for computation. So we find, uh, so now, if we, we have a problem of this form. Okay, in some norm that we like, let's say, okay, we will specify it later. Uh, yes. Uh, regarding the inner product in, in, in the definition of F, is it the H inner product? Yes, sorry. And then and then and then you will you will get in the right hand side the, the L2 norm, oh sorry, the H norm of UJ, right? Yes. So if you want so let's do all the steps. So this is uh, this is clear, okay. So if you expand this, you will have uh, lambda j okay. So how can you um simplify this well this one is equivalent to phi of x so this one becomes uh, uh, uj so becomes uj phi of x h times uj so it is this vector times this uh, this number okay and so if you substitute this here Will become uh, 
Yeah, I will be able to put this like this. Okay. But what is this? So this is a function in H. This is the evaluation functional. So it is just the evaluation of the function J, UJ in X. Okay. Are you familiar with the outer product? Uh, well, it's a, so this one is a, what, what, so F outer product G. So this is a rank one operator such that uh, if you do it, if you apply the inner product with V, it is uh, G star V uh, F. So, sorry. Okay. That's it. This is the property you have to use. Uh, well, that's it. So let's explore one second the property of the linearity we have. Well, uh, let's start from the simple one. So uh, okay, if you have a problem of this form, and we are okay to restrict our, our uh, set of functions to the set of non-negative function f. And to understand this, we have to see how well uh, calligraphic f represents uh, our function of interest. So possibly we would like the, the solution of this problem. So if you want, uh, assuming that this is the solution of this is given by an, a given f star, okay, if you do arg min, so a solution exists and corresponds to f star, you would like f star to be in calligraphic f. So this would be a, a a good reduction of the problem. So you go from here to and so this problem can be written equivalently in terms of A. So you want to find the uh, the best operator A such that you you will minimize um, L. Uh, A negative. So if you want F of A, or more explicitly, uh, so clearly you can write uh, phi of x, a phi of x as uh, the trace of a times a rank one operator. Okay, that is uh, phi of x tensor phi of x. Okay. And so And this is nice because you see that all the operations that you are going to apply to this function, like derivatives, integrals, and so on, will only affect uh, the second operator. And so, of course, this problem in general is still difficult. So we have to see under which condition we can obtain a finite dimensional representation, uh, which is the form that it takes. And we will see that we will obtain a kind of generalization of the representer theorem. Okay. Um, let's see some interesting things you can do there.
So in general, uh, let's say that, let's talk about integrals. Okay, so you want to do the integrals of f of a of x for some probability, some measure or uh, ch some charge mu. Okay, and this one corresponds to so you can write it in terms of a, a, a covariance operator. Sorry. C of mu, yes. Sorry, um, uh, I, I'm, I have a, a question. Like, so uh, to, to wrap up, let's say, so yes. I have, I want to minimize the functional L over F. Yes. But then instead of doing, the, with, with this boundary condition, with this condition. Yes. So instead of doing that, I work in the space of so F. You, you want to work in a space of non-negative functions. Yeah. Okay. Possibly that contains your solution. Okay, so this is something you have to check before doing this, okay? Mm -hmm. You know your, I don't know. You know that your solution is M times differentiable. Then you say, cool, I can use uh, a model that represents M times differentiable non-negative functions. And so your mm -hmm. the solution will be there. So you go here. Okay. So I use the uh, reproducing, reproducing Hilbert, reproducing Karen Hilbert space of the, um, so of the class fun. of function yes. I, want to, I want to be in. We need some some details there that we will see it later and maybe at this point okay. tomorrow. But let's say that you know you can prove that your function is there. Okay. 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 So once I'm in, uh, using the, the the reproducing kernel Hilbert space, then I know the uh, the the functional form of the phi. Yes. Because I know the kernel. Because yes. Exactly. It's an analytical one. Then I use the fact that I can the, be inside the semi the positive function thanks to. The fact that I will work with the tray with a semi-definite positive, mm -hmm. and I will use just the representation of the function with the PSD models. Exactly. Okay. So the fact that every function in calligraphic F can be written like this, like this. as okay. the so the trace of a okay. times this this phi, where phi is operator. the uh, connected with the kernel. Of exactly. The, space the kernel you have chosen. Okay. Thank you. Exactly. And uh, this is rank one. More generally, you can represent. Uh, uh, properties that you like, like, uh, for example, integrals that would become the so-called covariance operators. Okay, so this C mu now is what is the integral of uh, phi of x uh, times phi of x uh, in the mu. Okay, in general, to define this and to guarantee that it is. Uh, um, so this is compact. You need to have to uh, well to prove that some properties hold for phi. For example, that is, uh, for example, if phi is bounded, okay, uh, or even just put here a constant, okay. So you will have that uh, the trace of c hat c mu, okay, which corresponds to well. This is linear, you can do the trace of phi of x uh, times phi of x. The trace of uh, an outer product is exactly the inner product of the two uh, of the two vectors. Okay. This one is bounded by C square. Okay, so this one is what C square the mu okay so you see this one is stress class if you have a, a, a finite measure and your for example your um, um, yeah, your feature map is bounded okay more generally if it is square integrable you can prove that it is Hilbert Schmidt but this in general you know or, or, so you know the kernel, so you know the properties. Uh, so if your kernel is, uh, so this C is nothing more. So this is equal to X square, okay? But this is what? Well, this is equal to the supremum of X of KXX, okay? And so you just take your kernel. If it is L-infinity, that's it you have this constant, okay? So it's very easy to check this property, okay? 
And then of course, uh, so what is this? Uh, well, now it's still an abstract definition because you have to define this, uh, this covariance operator. When uh, A will be rank, finite rank or even expressible with respect to uh, uh, linear combination of uh, phi of X for some points, then you can give uh, a close form to, to this operator. Okay. So maybe we, so we have 10 minutes, so we can just prepare the, so I'm preparing all of this to arrive to the representative theorem that at this point we will do tomorrow. In general, the A I, I've written above are uh, infinite dimensional objects. They can have uh, a finite rank, but in any case, uh, they are expressed with respect to vectors uh, that have an infinite dimensional expansion. Okay. So there are, if you want, uh, a subclass that are the computable models that, as in uh, kernel methods, you have seen is the computable class of linear combination of kernel functions. Here, we can define something analogous. Okay. And so let's say, let's call them computable uh, PSD models. And um, are models written on this, of this form, BIJ okay, where B is a matrix n by n and positive semi-definite, okay? So you see this one is not only finite rank, rank n, but is expressible in a finite basis. That, uh, that is a, a basis given by some points, okay? Then of course, in general, if you have functions that you know in Hilbert, you can also express your A with respect to this list of functions, a finite list, okay? And so now we can write f of a explicitly for any x because it is phi of x a so as we did before this corresponds to the inner product of phi of x uh, um, Okay, so you see that this one, you can compute it in close form. You know your kernel, you evaluate it. So if you want to evaluate in the point X, you just evaluate your kernel function in X, in uh, X, X, I, X, X, this one is just the same. So if you want, uh, okay. And times the, the coefficients of your matrix. And so tomorrow in the representer theorem, we will show that if your functional is expressed in terms of the evaluation of your f of a over some points, and you have a suitable regularizer, your solution, even if you are optimizing over the whole space of PSD models, also the non-computable, your solution will be, we will have a computable form. Okay. Yes, uh, we can uh, close here. Good, thank you, Alessandro. Okay, so good afternoon to everybody. 
Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce you to this special seminar, uh, which uh, will be by Luigi Ambrosio, who is a professor and director also here at uh, Scuola Normale. So it's uh, also a host of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he will be talking about on some variational problems involving functions with bounded actions. So please, Luigi. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, some recent work. Uh, first of all, let me say I'm not an expert in uh, machine learning. I am more on the side of calculus of variation, geometric measure theory, but I got involved in this collaboration, in particular by Michael Lunzer um, in Lausanne. And uh, we had the first paper with uh, a PhD student of Lunzer, Shayan Ziznejad, Camillo Brena, who is a PhD student here in Pisa. And now there is a sequel. Uh, I, will I will talk about both papers, uh, a sequel with Camillo Brena and Sergio Conti, where we solved uh, some of the questions left open in the first paper. Okay, so let me start. Uh, so this is the plan of my talk, uh, some motivation. I will then focus on the space BH. BH stands, stands for bounded Hessian. Um, then I will mention a typical variational problem, and uh, and then I will go through the more geometric part, uh, uh, extreme and exposed points, and uh, um, our focus will be mainly on the on this class of functions, CP, WL, continuous piecewise linear or piecewise affine uh, functions. Okay, so this is the first paper, which is already available. Um, on archive. Um, if you are interested, uh, as I guess, many of you are more interested in, in on those more on the applied point of view. Uh, there is this literature, but you see also uh, there are papers also in our calculus of variation community, uh, very much related to this topic. Okay, uh, by the way, if you are interested to the slides, I will be happy to share the slides with you. Okay, so let me start with the very heuristic uh, presentation. So in the linear theory of uh, compressed assessing, uh, there is this important notion of sparsity, which means that uh, uh, in the series expansion, um, only a few coefficients are relevant, so they are sparse. And more recently, this aspect uh, started to be also investigated in problems in calculus of variation, and also more specifically in relation to the theory of machine learning. And in particular, in the CDV calculus of variation paper I, I listed before, uh, the model problem is this one, the typical one of the, one of the typical ones of machine learning, where um, E is the regularization uh, term. And then the point is that, uh, in some sense, you can encode uh, sparsity for minimizers by saying that, uh, uh, by proving that uh, there is a minimizer, or maybe all minimizers of this problem have this structure where, uh, well, forget about the C bar. Uh, C bar is a, is a term uh, um, which is in the kernel of phi. But the essential point of this formula is that you have a, a, a convex, uh, kind of convex representation, if you assume that uh, phi of u bar is equal to one, where the ui are kind of extreme points uh, for the unique ball of the energy phi. And so here comes uh, the geometric problem of uh, trying to characterize the extreme points and try to represent solutions as a combination of extreme points. In fact, this is the formula I already saw in words. Again, modulo this uh, null space, which is relevant for many applications, although it complicates a little bit of the matter, we are saying here that the UI are extreme points, uh, modulo, let's say in the quotient space, if you like, for uh, the phi energy for the unit ball of the phi energy. Okay, what is the connection with machine learning? I think uh, here I can run because many of you are experts and um, in the linear theory, 
one tries to represent uh, so the parametric class of function is um, is given by a linear behavior with respect to theta but now we know that uh, this model uh, is um, much less uh, performant than deep neural networks instead in deep neural networks there is uh, this uh, iterated applications of uh, a linear transformation, which here is denoted by W1, WL, and also by B1, BL. So these are uh, defined the, um, uh, some shift terms, and also a nonlinearity, which is typically is uh, the positive part, right? And so uh, Unser and collaborators single out uh, the class of CPWL functions, kind of you can think of them as a higher dimensional versions of of um, piecewise uh, or splines, uh, the one dimensional piecewise affine functions, as a natural class for this model. Why? Because in some sense, if you look for the simplest class, which is invariant under all these transformations, the simplest class you can imagine is precisely the CPWL. Uh, class. I mean, if you start even from a smooth function. Um, moreover, and here there is the analogy with the L1 minimization, uh, they propose that the, uh, the use of the space BH, which I define in a moment, uh, for those of you who don't know it, and uh, as energy, uh, the second, the total variation of the second derivative of U, is a natural regularization term. So which you, you should think of this as an, a continuous analog of the L1 um, regularization. With the, the idea is that this regularization should uh, favor, again, sparsity. Well, of course, if you are in the continuous setting, sparsity means uh, somehow concentration of derivative. Okay, so let me go now really a little through uh, the analytic preliminaries. What is the space BH? The space BH is the space of functions uh, in W11. So functions whose uh, uh, first order derivatives are given by L1 functions in the sense of distributions. And we ask that all derivatives are BV. So are functions of bounded variation, meaning that uh, the derivative of these functions are not functions, but measures. And in this class, uh, of course, we can include the class CPWL because for a piecewise affine function, actually the second order derivative is totally concentrated on, uh, on the discontinuities of the derivative, right? So the in this case, the derivative, the second order derivative is completely singular and concentrated on the discontinuities. Well, this, this uh, space has already been studied by, by some authors, also in connections with problems in uh, linear elasticity. Uh, we have already some classical results. For instance, uh, by Sobolev embedding, you can improve the integrability of the derivative. Um, um, and the case, the case equal, uh, two dimensional case is particularly is the critical case where you have uh, um, an embedding of uh, BH ins inside the class of continuous functions. Um, even though uh, the proof of this inclusion is not obvious, uh, unlike the case of Sobolev embedding, you can't prove it by approximation uh, because of a lack of density of smooth functions inside BV. So you have to do a very you have thought out a very specific, uh, let's say, geometry, ge GMT argument. Okay, so what, what will be very relevant for us is uh, what is the structure of the second order derivative. So the second order derivative, you may think of it as a matrix of measures, a symmetric matrix of me n, n by n matrix of measures. So the typical thing you can do is to write it as a, a scalar, which is the total variation, a scalar non-negative measure times a matrix, an n by n matrix, which has to be symmetric because we started from a symmetric object. 
but non -trivial, the non-trivial thing is due to Giovanni Alberti, which is here in the audience. Uh, a famous result by Giovanni Alberti says that the, we know much more. We know that HU, um, um, in correspondence of the singular part of the derivative, is a rank one matrix. Uh, in some simple situations, like for the CPWL functions, is pretty clear if you think uh, of a discontinuity like that, it is clear that the vector C, which models the, um, the second order derivative, it is orthogonal to the line of discontinuity. But uh, what Giovanni Alberti proved is that this is a general phenomenon. And so rank one plus um, symmetry tells you that uh, on the singular part of the derivative, of course, you don't have any restriction on the absolutely continuous part, think of, except for uh, symmetry. But uh, let's say on the singular part of the derivative, you have, you have a big restriction. HU is uh, um, a, a symmetric tensor product. Okay, so now what are the energies that we are going to consider? As soon as you have this representation, you can uh, choose your favorite norm on the space of matrices, or if you like, uh, just on the space of symmetric matrices, and they define uh, what I will call phi energy. It's a one homogeneous, lower semi-continuous, and one homogeneous uh, functional. And uh, particularly interested, and this was already singled out already in the applied literature, is the choice of the Schatten norm. Uh, so the sum of the modulus of the eigenvalues. And it is interesting to compare uh, with the canonical Euclidean norm. And we will see that some results are indeed not true and not, poss not even possible with the choice of the Euclidean norm, which motivates once more uh, the naturality in this setting of the, uh, the Schatten norm. Okay, so I'm going to define, to denote the two phi energies, uh, the one which we are more interested to, the induced by the Schatten norm by phi S and by phi, the canonical um, norm associated to the Euclidean, or if you like, a Hilbert-Schmidt norm on matrices. Okay, this is just a, a side comment which uh, um, will come later. If you, have, if you have a domain which is invariant under rotation, uh, the energy that we are considering as a natural um, as a natural monotonicity property, meaning that if you do the radial symmetrization of u, so you go back to a function of one, or basically a, a radial function, or if you like a function of, of one variable, then the energy decreases. So equivalently, u rad is uh, the mean value on the sphere with modulus mod with radius modulus of x of uh, of u. Okay, so let's see. Um, uh, in connection with the, the variational problems I mentioned before, what what is the energy which is which has already been considered in this paper? Um, So let's say we might consider uh, this energy with uh, the usual uh, tuning parameter lambda between E and phi. And it is not difficult to prove that uh, in general, this problem is ill-posed in dimension higher than three. The essential reason is that uh, in some sense, the, this energy is not sufficiently strong to, to control the value of u at single points meaning that uh, in dimension higher than three, you can modify the value of u at a single point, uh, paying uh, an arbitrary small amount of energy. So this problem is ill-posed. On the other hand, in dimension one, it is well-posed. And actually, um, the study of this problem performed by Unser and collaborators shows that uh, really there is uh, uh, the, um, the sparsity. So minimizers are really splines in dimension one, which is also one motivation to go to higher dimension. 
the case n equal to is critical because uh, we are still able to uh, specify the value at single points uh, to but to modify the value of a function you pay some energy and so what you have to do is to, uh, you have to make a kind of analysis of the Hessian concentration along the minimizing sequences and uh, one of the theorems that we prove in the second paper with uh, uh, Brenna and uh, Conti is that uh, for instance in dimension two if uh, the tuning parameter lambda uh, does not exceed a threshold this critical threshold for pi then this problem has minimizers let's say with a kind of canonical choice of v and also if q equal one it is true for any lambda and so uh, where where this uh, fact, this uh, critical value for pi comes from, comes from exactly from the heuristic argument I was telling you before. You have to to try to understand how much energy uh, you need to to kind of this is a kind of capacitary problem uh, to to put the value of u at zero equal to one and to have a compact support. Okay, so this is, but this is more or less a traditional modulo, a more detailed analysis, but let me go instead now to the geometric part, which I think is more, more new, and to recall some notions from convex analysis. So first of all, what I mean, what do we mean by extreme points uh, for a set S inside the vector space V? Um, is an extreme point if it can be, can't be written as a convex combination, let's say as a non-trivial convex combination. So it's a convex combination of distinct points in S. And uh, actually there is a more uh, sophisticated notion of uh, exposed points, which is typically uh, done uh, adding uh, to the structure the, the topology or let's say, if you like, in a Banach space, uh, let's say more generally in a topological Banach space, you say that V is an exposed point if it is the unique minimizer on S for some continuous linear function L. Okay, so what are uh, the basic uh, basic uh, results of the, this is a very classical theory, already developed, and developed in the 40s, in the 50s, well, first of all, um, a compact convex set is the closest convex hull of the extreme points. It is simply the convex hull without taking the closure in finite dimension. There is a famous theorem by Caratheodori. And what is the relation between exposed points and extreme points? It is quite easy to prove that uh, exposed points which uh, uh, you remember are unique minimizers of uh, linear functionals are extreme, but it is not true the converse, not even, uh, not even in R2. I mean, uh, of course, they are equivalent only on the real line. However, what is interesting is that uh, we have always, let's say, if you have com com convexity, compactness, we have always sufficiently many exposed points because by taking the closure of exposed points, uh, you get uh, all, uh, you include all the extreme points. And so you can also rephrase um, Krein-Milman theorem in terms of the exposed points. Okay, so this is um, more or less what we need at the level of geometric uh, um, convex analysis. And before going to our problem, which is a second order problem, uh, let me show you what is known. And again, this is ultra classical for, for the first order problem. So instead of looking to the phi energy, which is a second order derivative, we look at the first order derivative. And so we look at to the space BV, or more precisely, let's say that omega is connected we look to BV star, which is BV modulo constants, because of course the kernel of this energy will, will be made by constants. 
and then uh, uh, it is not difficult to show that the u is extremal if and only if, uh, uh, of course, uh, you should be on the sphere. Uh, it's extremal for the ball if you are on the sphere, but uh, not only. Uh, u should be a constant multiple of a characteristic function. Not, not only, of course, the constant is related to the perimeter of v, but also the set e should be in some measure theoretic sense that I will specify connected. So roughly speaking, the extreme points of S are, are constant multiples of characteristic functions of connected sets. Okay, let's see how the proof works. <clears throat> so take a U extremal, and let me assume for just for simplicity that U is non-negative. Then, as I said, it's pretty clear that you have to stay on the sphere. And this is a clearly a necessary condition. And then uh, you, you try to the most obvious decomposition you can imagine for functions. You do this decomposition at a level, at an intermediate level L. And uh, you call alpha and beta the perimeters of the super level sets integrated from zero to L and from L to infinity, respectively. And then by the Quaria formula, alpha plus beta is equal to one, is equal to the total variation, which is one. And then uh, this provides to you um, a kind of legal decomposition of uh, uh, as a convex combination of V1 and V2, where V1 and V2 are in the unit ball, they are even on the sphere. And so if U is extreme, this means that V1 and V2 uh, should be equal to U, which means that uh, U wedge L is parallel to U minus L plus. <clears throat> and since the level L is arbitrary, this tells you that all, all super level sets of uh, U are, are the same. So all, either a, a set E or the empty set. And so you get uh, that uh, necessarily U must have this structure, right? This is the only um, possibility for this to, to occur. And then the last part is more geometric measure theory, uh, is due to Federer. Uh, once we know that you have this structure, uh, there is a general theorem due to Federer saying that any set with finite perimeter can be written as a, like in topology, in some sense, like open sets in topology, like the finite of, or countable union of indecomposable components. And the uh, decomposable means that you can write a set E as a disjoint union of two sets in such a way that the perimeters add. So if E is uh, uh, if E were decomposable again, you can try to split uh, U in uh, in a non-trivial convex combination, and so eventually this proves, uh, uh, let's say, the necessary part that necessarily E is indecomposable. The other implication also is not difficult that indecomposability implies extremality. Okay, so this is the first order problem. Instead, we are now interested to our second order problem. Uh, and again, now I have to take uh, the kernel of my phi energy, which are uh, the affine functions. So BH star stands for BH modulo affine functions. And we would like to understand the extreme points of S. As I said in, in 1D, this is not particularly difficult to prove all extreme points are piecewise uh, linear. And of course, uh, the higher dimensional candidates uh, will be uh, CPWL functions. On the other hand, before coming to the results, uh, let me say that in higher dimension, we expect more rigidity. Why? Because uh, first of all, we are dealing with the second order problem. And also, in some sense, we have many more choices of the norm, right? So we expect also the problem to be sensitive 
to the choice of the norm. And so the questions that we started to uh, characterize in the first paper is, uh, um, first of all, inside the class of CPWL functions can be characterized those functions who are extreme. Well, of course, the structure of CPWL functions is um, basically is a finite structure, so this is possible. So we did it in the first paper. While I, uh, I think uh, uh, an interesting question is whether uh, this can be done for the more restrictive notion of uh, being exposed. The second question that uh, uh, we raised uh, in the first paper, but we didn't have a, a complete answer, is whether all the extreme functions are CPWL or not, like in dimension one. And actually, in the second paper with uh, um, Brenna and Conti, um, we proved that the answer is no. And uh, for instance, the truncated cone, um, if you normalize it in such a way that uh, the norm of the second derivative is equal to one, is an extreme point. And the proof is uh, absolutely non-trivial. Um, it requires, uh, in some sense, the radial averaging lemma to reduce somehow to dimension one, but uh, uh, a, a, let's say a, a non-trivial analysis of the second order derivative, where, uh, by the way, Alberti's theorem plays a role, is really is really needed. And in fact, another another open question which I would like to raise is whether, again. For this specific function, uh, maybe it is exposed. And uh, here the question will be to find a, maybe a good linear function, which will provide, by the way, a, a much simpler proof compared to ours. OK, anyhow, now we know that not all CPWL functions are, uh, not all extreme functions are CPWL. And so these negative results brings us to the next question. Well, at least we might try to say whether CPWL functions are dense or not. Of course, the density here has to be understood in a particular way. It is what we call in calculus of variation density in energy. Of course, CPWL functions are dense in LP, in, uh, in reasonable topologies, uh, weak topologies. But here, uh, the main ingredient, because uh, we are really dealing with our energy. Uh, and so for instance, if you, have a, if you have a function on the sphere, we would like to have the approximating functions to be on the sphere as well. And so we want, let's say that uh, the approximating function converge in L1, but with the convergence of the energies. It is not phi s of uh minus u going to zero. This is not possible in general. But we just ask uh, phi s of uh that the energies are convergent to the energy. And what is here crucial, uh, in general, these energies are lower semi-continuous, is to get the, uh, uh, the Linsup inequality, so the inequality from above. So to estimate in a very efficient way uh, the, estim uh, the energy of uh, the approximation UH. Okay, so let's say a few um, more or less classical facts about uh, this problem. Well, first of all, uh, by convolutions, smooth functions are dense in energy, whatever norm you choose. So this problem is equally difficult if you, your target function is smooth. It's not simplified, particularly by the fact that your function U is smooth. So let's say we could say start with a smooth function and try to approximate it by CPWL functions without loss in energy. If the analogous question, which here I raised for the Schatten norm, had the positive answer for the Euclidean norm, then there is a general theorem due uh, to the Russian mathematician Reshetniak saying that uh, because of the strict convexity of the Euclidean norm, as soon as you have convexity of phi convergence, sorry, of phi, 
you have convergence for any other energy. Unfortunately, it is the answer to this question for the Euclidean norm is false. So we can't use this argument. And again, this justifies again the naturality of the Schatten norm uh, in this setting. So why did it, is, is, it is false? Well, uh, the idea is that uh, the shut and the Euclidean norm coincides on rank one matrices. And so whenever uh, the second derivative has no absolutely continuous part, for instance, for the piecewise linear functions, then the two energies coincide. On the other hand, they do not coincide on, uh, let's say, a function which is an absolutely continuous part in the derivative, like a quadratic function. And so if you combine uh, these two observations, uh, you get that if you, um, uh, if you had the positive answer for phi, uh, then you will get that the lin soup of phi s of u tilde h will be the lin soup of phi e of u tilde h, which will be less than phi if we assume that there is a positive answer to phi, but this contradicts um, the strict inequality here. So this problem has no solution for the Euclidean norm. But, uh, uh, okay, before coming to the solution, let me stress with this intermediate result that I want to stress where the difficulty comes from. So a result which is uh, um, easier to prove, and actually this is, again will be true for any choice of phi, is that uh, you can find an approximating sequence uh, with convergence in energy, let's say, up to a multiplicative constant, which depends on the dimension. Uh, so let's say a suboptimal approximation. Uh, this is very standard because to achieve this result, you can just do a, a basically quite not any um, interpolation you like. You start from a smooth function. You can do, for instance, the Lagrange interpolation and then basically playing with the Poincaré inequality um, along any of the simplexes, uh, you get, um, without uh, too much work, this inequality, where the constant Cn comes essentially from the constant you have in the Poincaré inequality. And the question is, uh, how can... Uh, uh, how to optimize this procedure in such a way to get, and this is specific of the Schatten norm, C of n is equal to one. Uh, well, this is a very common idea uh, for the experts in gamma convergence that we have in some sense to adapt uh, our construction to the local behavior of u. But where the difficulty comes from, you have to, uh, to do this uh, keeping uh, at the same time a control on the, the generation of geometry. Uh, I think many of you know very well that uh, uh, even in the Lagrange interpolation theorems, uh, the constants in the bending depend on the minimal angle you have in the in the, the composition in the simplexes. So in particular, if uh, the geometry that generates is the geometry of the simplexes is not under control, you can't get uh, um, not even a uniform estimate. Okay, so in the first paper with uh, Shayan, uh, Zizj, Nejad, Brena, and Unser, we solved the problem by a specific construction. I will tell you just a, a few words about that, and then I will stop. And more recently, with a, I will say, quite different proof, uh, we get we got uh, in the second paper with Brennan and Conti we got uh, the same result in any number of dimension. Why uh, this this result of density in energy is relevant? Let me go back again to the motivation. Well, you can use this this result to prove that all the extreme points maybe are not CPWL but uh, are can be approximated very efficiently in energy by CPWL functions. Okay, so let me um, just spend maybe the last uh, few minutes with uh, a very rough idea of the first theorem 
uh, it will be too long to uh, to go through the uh, the second to, through the second result uh, through in any number of dimensions. Okay, so as I said, the essential idea is to adapt uh, the triangulations to the local behavior of you. So let's say that uh, your initial um, uh, the composition in cube is this one is the tilted one. Uh, you're looking uh, uh, in a region, let's say in this square, in a region where the second derivative, we are starting from a smooth function, right? We already reduced the problem to a smooth, to the smooth case. So your smooth function, let's say in some region as a Diessian, which is almost constant. And so you choose a frame in that region uh, where uh, Diessian is diagonal. So let's say that in this frame, in this uh, in this uh, square, in the large one that I I wrote here, um, in this frame, uh, the second derivative of u is almost or very close to, to a uh, to a diagonal matrix. Okay, in that case, you know that uh, uh, the decomposition, which is really optimal, which goes, which gives you c of n equal to one for the shutter norm is the canonical one. So you can decompose really uh, this square in triangles, in standard triangles. The problem is how to continue because of course you have to imagine that you have different, many different squares and they, uh, that you have to match, to match the behavior of uh, um, this decomposition with the, the, the composition in the other squares. And then the idea is, uh, to iterate uh, uh, this construction. So you see that uh, in larger and larger re regions, you do uh, the canonical decomposition because you know that in this region, you are basically in the right frame, but uh, you have this kind of boundary layer, which becomes uh, thinner and thinner. And you have to be sure that um, by iterating uh, this procedure, the angles uh, remain under control. So uh, the smallest angle, in some sense, uh, does not go uh, to zero. And in the case, uh, in the two-dimensional case, um, maybe this is very specific. I doubt that this is possible to do in higher dimension. There is a kind of self-similar construction uh, which enables to do this. And so eventually, you are able, just by self-similarity, to estimate uh, uh, the minimal angle, and then to carry out uh, uh, the construction. Okay, so I think I can stop here, and I thank you for the attention. Mm. Okay, so thank you very much, Luigi. So are there any questions, comments? Uh... Uh, when you define the um, other no exposed points, Yes. Somehow the topology is important. Which linear function on BD? Uh, what is linear in that case? Is some weak star topology? Yeah, this is a good question because actually to go from the, uh, let's say, the inclusion uh, uh, extreme, uh, so, sorry, exposed are extreme is true, whatever topology you choose, right? Mm -hmm. So it would, be, it would have been much simpler to say a linear function to define uh, being exposed uh, without any reference to topology, actually. But I guess that in the end, uh, one should look for some reasonable topology. So uh, not the dual topology but, uh, the of question, PD. But, uh, but uh, uh, let's say that eventually we'll be happy just with the linear function, right? To, for instance, to prove that cones are exposed, um, it will be nice to prove it for some reasonable topology, right? And that will be will give a proof of extremality, which is maybe much simpler than we than the one we gave. Right? Once you devise a good linear function. Uh, so I had a question, a couple of questions. So first is so the the capacitary energy that you yeah. introduced. So the four pi is really the the the, the capacitary film, energy. Film, yeah. Okay. And uh, so could could you go also to higher orders? Because in this way you said that uh, of course. Uh, you can treat the, the 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 problem in dimension two, yes. but it goes to dimension three, etc. 
mm. is, is completely opposed. Yeah. But can you go higher order? So you take uh, uh, yeah, third derivative or something you, like that? I mean, if you put enough uh, derivatives, yes. I mean, if you consider the third order, by higher order, you mean third order derivative in R3? Yeah, I think it's a scaling. Yeah, I think. Uh, um, actually, I'm not so sure because of this inclusion by the Magell might be special of dimension two. Uh, I don't know if a three derivatives in R3. Okay, so, okay, good. Okay, yeah, so okay. It, will, it will make sense for any, at least uh, formally, it will make sense uh, for any number of derivatives. You expect some kind of similar results to hold, uh, of course, more complicated, so... Yeah, CPWL, yeah, no, not not anymore CPWL, but you know, yeah, piecewise quadratic. Exactly, exactly. And then we miss also this uh, uh, very nice uh, specific structure of the second order derivative, which also plays a role, uh, an important role. Yeah. Okay, so, okay, so we thank again uh, Luigi. Thank you. My pleasure.